燃え上がれガンダム<音楽>
Uh, but then for various different reasons, the TV show is never properly sort of like greenlit for full production, but they have a bunch of scripts written for the first 13 or so episodes, a bunch of like mech designs, character designs. It's the same character designer, um, Yoshikazu Yasuhiko from the original Mobile Suit Gundam. It's the same mech designer, Kunio Okawada for from the original Gundam. So it's like kind of that team back together again, because they also worked on Zeta and Double Zeta um, mostly. And so... You know, they had a lot of the kind of pre-production material done for the early sections of the show and a draft or like outline for what the full plot would be, but didn't get greenlit for the entire production. Instead, what they were able to do was take the raw materials that they had um, and turn them into a two-hour movie that basically tells more or less what the broad plot for the full TV show would have been. Obviously hugely tremendously cut down from from the actual scope of what the show would have covered now here's a point of question i have though yes it doesn't feel to me like it's trying to do all 50 it feels like it's a cut down of those 13 scripts like this feels like it's the first arc of the show because it basically is like they get to the end of the first major bad guy it's and i think maybe the character arc with sea book and cecily is where they wanted to ultimately end up but it really feels to me like this is the opening arc of the series not what all 50 would be especially because you can basically count in that middle hour the episodes and like it adds up to 13 pretty clearly if you go through the different stories being told I think it's probably a mixture of both of those. I think it is the bulk of the story is from that like original, but I do not think that like the the bugs in that element, like the ending of this movie feels like the ending of a TV show. It does not feel like it would have been just another episode, right? Like like that's too I, Yes and no, because I can imagine like I can imagine episode 13 we're getting into story a little bit. Yeah. I can imagine episode 13 or like that point in the story would have been like the introduction of the bugs, but on a smaller scale, and then I do think the ending probably would have been trying to stop the bugs on Earth and the Moon, and what the ending of this is is a mix of those two things. It's yeah. Because plot-wise, it's the introduction of the bugs, but the big f and and honestly, part of that is that the the movie climax is about 10 minutes before the ending with defeating the bad guy and then the the real ending of the movie is all about the characters and that feels like where they're kind of jumping ahead the most to me and like let's find a way to wrap this up but yeah i mean this is ultimately semantic but it is just interesting to me when you're talking about how much did they cram in here is it 50 half hours is it 13 is it somewhere in the middle it's it's too much it's definitely too much yeah, but how much too much? It, it's very easy for me to imagine the 50 episode TV show that basically is the scope of this movie with like almost the entire middle cut out, which would have been all the stuff with the ship, all the stuff in that colony, like the space arc, Bergy, the, the other pilot, like all of that is so thin. And then obviously like story arcs and character arcs involving all the other survivors from the original colony attack. Like all of that is like there's no hint of basically in the movie at all, but you can kind of imagine where, where like whole like multi-episode arcs would have occurred in a hypothetical TV show. Anyways, point being that the movie that we get is this bizarre Frankenstein's monster of pieces from a, like what would be a much, 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 much bigger story compressed into a two hour movie. Um, meaning that like, you know, talking about things in terms of first, second, and third act and <laughs> things like that become very confusing and complicated because there is just a, a whole middle 40 minutes or so of the movie that is incredibly um, truncated and cuts that are very sharp and sudden where characters are in places that are, it's, you don't know why they're there, how they're there, um, relationships like change incredibly quickly. Um, and and it's, so it's a very sort of like, it's a bizarre but fascinating movie. And one thing that I think is very fun about it is the experience of watching it and imagining what the fully fleshed out version would have been because it is such a good story and they are such great characters, great designs, great concepts, and a really cool continuation of, like, in a very different continuation than Unicorn Gundam that was obviously actually made much later, but in terms of the podcast that we're doing, um, you know, this movie could not possibly happen after, what, you know, the story of Unicorn Gundam. And it's a very different vision for 
the way that the world kind of forgets about new types and kind of forgets about that conflict like you know 30 something years after after most of that stuff has happened the world has kind of moved on in a weird way which just feels in some ways more authentically gundam to me than the like new type explosion of unicorn gundam that's obviously set shortly after shars counterattack here I like the way that the new typeness kind of has faded away and it's a very different feeling setting than than what we got, even if it is still technically Universal Century. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, what I said when I first saw the movie, I watched the movie for the first time in like late September and I, I looked back at some of my old tweets and I wrote, it really doesn't work as a two hour movie, but if you take it as the most elaborate and expensive pitch reel ever made for a season of TV anime, there's a lot of great stuff contained within. And I think that might be the best way to look at it because that's basically mm -hmm. what it is. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, I think we are going to spend more time than usual just talking about the production because it is so good. And I think what it is to me is getting the original band back together in that this is Yoshiyuki Tomino, as you said, directing and writing. It's Yoshikazu Yasuhiko on the character designs. It's Kunio Okawara on the mech designs because they they had, obviously they did the original show together. They largely did Zeta, although there were other cooks in the kitchen for that with yeah. the um, designs of everything. And then uh, Yoshi, uh, Yasuhiko and Okawara were not on Double Zeta, although Double Zeta is reusing a lot of their stuff. And then they're not on Char's Counterattack either. Um, and then we have, you and I, watched a lot of other Gundam stuff that has none of those three um, and talked about that on this show. Like, well, Unicorn actually did, uh, Yasuhiko did the designs for the books, so they're kind yeah. of based on that. Um, but like for me, Sean, I just have to say Gundam aesthetically at least is at its purest to me when it's those three like especially Yasuhiko like I think Yoshikazu Yasuhiko's designs are like the definitive Gundam art style to me I love it so much the art styles of original Gundam this movie and then Gundam the Origin are my three favorite like art styles in Gundam they're the ones I like to see the most um, and I think it gets its fullest expression here its purest expression would be the origin manga, which is just Yasuhiko drawing everything you're seeing. But I think for moving images, it's definitely this movie. And I think there's something about seeing that original team getting to do a gigantic, crazily expensive movie production, because this movie looks like it cost all the money in the world at a certain point. Um, there's something so pure and magical about it. If it was even more of a disaster of a story, I might still love it because the aesthetics are just that good. Yeah, absolutely. Like it is it is a gorgeous looking production top down and it is and I agree with you that for me it is Yasuhiko's character designs are very like in you know, I love lots of the other Gundam shows and series and stuff that have um very different aesthetics to them, but it is Yasuhiko's stuff that is that's what that's what people look like in Gundam in my head is they it yes. always kind of goes back to that that core aesthetic. Abso-fucking-lutely. Um yeah, and, and there's a lot of other good things about this. We will talk about it later. The, I think the music in this movie is fantastic, but there's a big asterisk we should put by that. Uh -huh. We'll get to later. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is, it's a sumptuous production. It's a fascinating story. It is kind of fascinating in its incomprehensibility. Is this a Gundam thing I would recommend to a newcomer to the franchise? No. No. But if you are in deep like us... I think you would get a whole hell of a lot out of F91. And I will tell you, it is a movie that I have spent a lot of time thinking about because the first time I watched it, it kind of baffled me, but I loved the visuals and some of the story beats. And then I just kind of kept thinking about it. And it's kind of funny. The last movie we talked about was the newest Gundam movie, Gundam Narrative, um, which is the sequel to Unicorn. And by almost every measure about storytelling, Gundam Narrative is a better movie. Like it tells a much more complete and like coherent story obviously but i have spent so much more time thinking about f91 because i think f91 is so much kind of bolder and purer in its approach even if it is much much more scattershot um yeah i just this and char's counterattack i think are a hell of a one-two punch for gundam in that 80s to 90s moment and really feels like it's weird to say about a movie that is so disjointed. It does feel like Tomino and friends on the top of their game in a mm -hmm. weird way. Yeah. Know? like Yeah. It is, it is obviously compromised by the nature of what it is, but what is there is phenomenal. Um, and, and particularly the areas like the beginning and ending that are the so most good. fully realized, like when the show or when the movie just gets to sort of be 
what it is kind of uninterrupted, it is some of the best Gundam stuff that exists in the franchise. And so, yeah, if you are a fan of Gundam, like the idea of skipping F91 is absurd to me. Like this movie is required watching if you are already invested into Gundam. It would be hilarious, though, for this to be the first Gundam thing for you to watch. You would be so fucking confused constantly um, because they do not stop to explain concepts at all. Because it's it's the combination of two things. It is the, the compression of a much larger TV show story into two hours. And it's that TV show story being a Tomino story, which already requires much more focus and um attention to kind of put everything together because he likes to leave lots of things unstated and character arcs to be more sort of almost like up to interpretation in some ways why characters behave in certain ways like Char's motivations are always sort of unstated and more for you to kind of dig into the characters um and so those two things in many ways do not you would think would just like spoil the whole thing together but in many ways I think that's what makes F91 so fascinating is that it, it is pushing some of Tomino's eccentricities in terms of his storytelling style to its absolute fucking limit by having it to be even far further compressed than anything he would normally do. Yeah, you know, let me put it this way. I think the greatest downside to F91 is also its greatest upside, and that is let too much is left to the imagination, you know, mm -hmm. both because it is compressed, but it's also unfinished. Like, the movie ends with a title card that says this is just the beginning. Like... Tomino wanted to do an F91 sequel. He wanted to continue this story. And we will talk about Crossbone Gundam later because he kind of did. But Crossbone Gundam is more like a Zeta Gundam style sequel than it is a straight up follow up to F91. Like Crossbone Gundam skips all the material that would have been the actual sequel to F91. Um, and so on that level, there is the downside is it's a little disappointing to see all these great ideas that will never be brought fully to fruition. But at the same time, because of that, I find that the movie really captures the imagination in a way that some better Gundam productions don't. Because those better Gundam productions are like filled out and they're finished and they got to be completed. So there's not as much room to just... Con like the ending of F91 is sort of eternally haunting because you never see the next step. And I mm -hmm. think that's kind of... The, the 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 great unfinished beauty of it in in a weird way you know i agree that there's a quality there's like an almost dreamlike quality to f91 um because it is in this weird compressed pseudo unfinished state that that yeah. is more evocative than maybe it could have been had it had it been fully created into a tv show so well, let's start at the beginning sean oh yeah because as you said, the beginning and end of F91 are phenomenal. The beginning in particular, the first 30 minutes of this movie are basically the best enemy mechs invade a colony story Gundam has ever done. Like, And pretty much every Gundam show starts with mechs invade a colony. I would say the only competition F91 has is the original Gundam and the original mm -hmm. Gundam's opening episode. And this might even top that in terms of just what a visceral, heart-pounding, holy fucking shit of an opening salvo this movie offers. Yeah, because it is... Because one thing that's interesting is it is almost exactly about 25 minutes long. It is basically what would be the first episode of the TV show. Um, and yeah. and it, it feels like probably like maybe if it had been the actual TV show, they would have split it into two episodes, kind of like what Zeta or, or Victory kind of do, and, and expand out some more of the character stuff there. But you can imagine cutting basically at the like 24 25 minute mark and saying well there's like the most lavish gorgeously produced first episode of an anime ever made for tv anime um because it is it is the most uninterrupted focused part that the movie ever gets to have because it's just the beginning and yeah it is it is the best calling attack sequence um like gundam has or like really any franchise has for that deals with space colony stuff um it, it is obviously i think like Maybe some of the narrative stuff in Mobile Suit, the original Mobile Suit Gundam, is a little bit more effective because it has the pacing and things that it gets to have there for, like, the full story. But in terms of just sort of, like, visceral audience experience of the of this nature of, like, this attack on a civilian population, nothing in Gundam, like, hits um, as nearly as hard as F91 does. It is, it is frightening. 
It is scary. Like, this is the part where, like, the mechs are the most terrifying in any mech franchise I've seen is the first 20 minutes or so of F-91 where these massive machines have invaded this colony and people are just dying left and right. Um, even, like, like machines will do things as accidents and it will kill, like, a dozen people. You know, it's that kind of stuff um, that makes them truly, truly awful and frightening weapons of war and and they do not feel like big like blown up toys or something at the beginning of this at all no and i think the defining image for me and for a lot of people i'm sure this is for you too sean is the there's a mech that is firing a shell casing falls out the shell casing is bigger than a person it hits a mother on the head while she is running with her newborn new it kills her the baby is left behind and then one of the girls in the in the teenage group with sea book grabs the baby and runs with it but just that image of because it's so fast but that shell casing comes down bonks her on the head kills her on impact and like yeah i think it's one of the defining images in all of gundam not just this movie like if you had to pick one image to define like tomino gundam this would be one of the ones you would pick yeah, which it, it feels like something that, again, like it's one of those where it feels like probably when they're making Mobile Suit Gundam, this is an idea that Tomino had because it is very similar to a shot from the first episode of Gundam where Amuro is running away from the shells from the Zaku gun and it's falling and it's like bigger than the truck that's next to it. And so he had that idea of the contrast of like normal human sized things next to like the detritus of this giant machine of war and how frightening that, that juxtaposition is. And probably for Mobile Suit Gundam, they wouldn't have let him just have that fucking shell drop on someone and kill them. Um, but for F-91, like some fucking awful violent shit happens in those first 20 minutes in particular. And that's one of those. And, and it like hits her in the head, kills her instantly. And it is like the lingering details of, because it's Cecily that goes over to get the child and she sees... Um, like the mother's just there with her eyes still open and a blank stare with like blood dripping down her forehead and Cecily has to like, you know, close her eyes and then grab the child. It, it is those little details of of the cost of the violence of these weapons that, that really stands out about that sequence. Um, that, yeah, that, that one is the main one for me. Like I think about that all the time in relation to mechs uh, and Gundam with, with that sequence with the shells. And then there's also the part where I think his name is Arthur. Yep, Arthur. Um, when he's, yeah, he's on the like gun tank looking thing. And him and some of the other um, boys are like, yeah, we're going to take it to him. We've got these like bazookas. We're in this like mech. Um, and then the top of the mech just gets like kicked or something. And he just goes flying against the wall and is killed instantly. And it's that one of those things where you're like, any other TV show would have had Arthur get like hurt by that, but he would have survived. And it's like, nope, this is a dude that like, out of the group of characters we have so far, he feels like any of them could be like, you know, part of the Scooby gang or whatever, like part of like the main group of teenage sort of like heroes. And not for Arthur, unfortunately. He's, he's, he's the one that just gets the boot to the head and is just immediately killed. It's basically depicted kind of like uh, the girl who's with Kai in the original Gundam, and she gets blown mm -hmm. off by the just G-force of the missile firing, and she falls into the ocean. This is even more visceral. It's the G-force sends him back, and then he hits a wall, and the wall kills him. Yeah. It's, uh, it's wild. Yeah, the first 25 minutes are utterly breathless. Like, you can't take your eyes away. You can barely breathe. It is so nonstop. And then the movie... The, the movie is actually very well paced until it conspicuously isn't because uh -huh. it's very well paced for that opening section up to the point where when Tomino wants you to take a breath, he puts in an insert song and it's the song that will also play over the credits. And like, there's a minute that's just a montage of, in that case, it's Cecily kind of joining the Rona family. And there's just a minute where you're allowed to kind of like, I noticed for me, Sean, last night, like I untensed, I sat back in my chair. I, I was unconsciously like sitting up and forward looking at the TV. And that moment, Tomino is inviting you to like, relax now. It's like, it's extremely masterful cinematic storytelling, I think. Absolutely. Because there's, especially the, the, the like kind of last big moment you have um, before you get that chance to like sort of relax because you think you can relax because they all get on like the lifeboat lifeboat launches from the colony you're like oh, okay oh thank god they're alive they got out and then a hole blows out of the colony and like just dirt 
and trees and then people and cars and buildings and just get sucked out into space and just bombard the lifeboat as they fly through this like vortex just ejecting civilization into the like vacuum of space it's like jesus fucking christ that like you can't like you can't get away with anything like even when you think you're out of the colony you're still like like dead bodies are still smacking into your goddamn windshield yeah i mean that shot hit me more this time because i noticed it's it's there for I kid you not, a couple of frames, it's not even a full second, but there's a dog that gets sucked yep. out, and the just image of this lifeless dog, oh my god. And then I think there's a cow later on, like, if you went through it frame by frame, you'd see a ton of stuff, because it's extremely fast. Um, but yeah, that's amazing. I, I think the, the whole way they... Because you're right, like, in terms of character stuff, the opening episode of the original Gundam is inarguably better at, like, introducing Amuro, introducing Frau, introducing Char, all of, like, the players. Um, this one is kind of just like, let's go, go. You have a brief introduction to Seabook and Cecily um, with this pageant thing. Like, they're just kind of carefree, dumb teenagers. Um, and I do like that setup. But then it's, mm -hmm. like, off to the races, and you really don't learn about Seabook and Cecily until a little later in the movie. And then I think it actually characterizes them very well. But uh, this one is just go, go, go. There's a bunch of great little touches, like um, the first mech they sort of pilot is what looks like the tank form of like the double Zeta or something that's in this museum, because it's kind of following the tradition of Zeta and then double Zeta of the, the pilot always has the last pilot's mech. And in this case, it's like, well, the last pilot was 30 years ago, so this is something in a museum, is like standing in for that. Um, which is something we should talk about later, is also how this, sh this movie is very clearly setting up a storyline that would have been basically like remixing a lot of the elements from the original Gundam. And it winds up not getting to do that very much, because it's just a two-hour movie, but like, it does that in a lot of very interesting ways, I think. Absolutely, yeah. And, and... I'm trying to think of like other th details to point out from that opening sequence because because another thing I really like is the way that they are as the kids are running like they're like grabbing other people like yep. the group like grows as they're sort of just trying to figure out how to evacuate um while while all the shit is going on and so they're just like grabbing like children and babies and stuff and and creating this larger group um that some of like the 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 sort of core cast of Victory Gundam has a similar feel of like we're getting like this range of different ages of kids and this sort of like larger cast of smaller kids together. Um, I feel like they kind of reuse that idea a little bit for Victory, but it has this very effective feel of that like kids versus adults theme uh, that Tomino is like the core thing for Tomino in this kind of stuff is you have it's not just here's like our three plucky teenagers it's like this small almost like family of kids that are of all different ages from like an infant child to a six-year-old girl to seabook and cecily that are probably like 16 to 18 years old um and they're all in it together against you know like the jackass earth federation dude who says like oh let's let's grab this like tank and use it and use the kids as shields because the crossbone vanguard sure, surely would not shoot down a mech that is just full of children and so it's it's them against the world of the adults and of cynicism and violence um as this whole family of young kids yeah and it's one of the disappointments about there not being a full f91 series is i really like what we see of the group that builds here and it's too bad we never got to see them sort of in action and see how that would develop over time because i think it's one of the most promising gundam casts you can't say it's one of the best because it never gets to develop really the only ones who do are seabook and cecily um which makes sense it's a two-hour movie i don't know how you could do more than that but yeah uh should we also just talk about in this opening act how fucking good the mechs are Oh my god, yeah, no, like the, because it's a combination of just the, like, incredibly high quality of the animation, um, like, it is so gorgeous, um, just, like, watching the mechs move in space is incredible, but also, yeah, a lot of the, the specific designs of the mechs in F91, um, you've got the, the Jagan, that is the old standby, it's our, like, the new GM type, and I love the Jagan, but the, um, The Jagan is, like, the old, light green one, right? Yeah, it's the main one that the Earth Federations use. I really and love I, the I, color I, on that. Yeah, the Jagan is really great. But then, yeah, you have all the different um, crossbone Gundam ones that are the, that the crossbone Vanguard use. And the um, 
I'm looking at all the names here. The Din and Zon, which is basically their version of the Zaku, is really good. Of it, they basically go so far with the these are like Nazi war machines that they basically just have like a mech version of the Nazi helmet on. They've um, got those big eyes, those like big goggles. I love those. Yeah, with like big sort of like gas mask goggles on. Um, yeah, there's it's just all over the place. The designs for these mechs are so good. It is what again, it's one of the things that's like disappointing about this being the only like sort of fully produced version of this section of Gundam is that these designs are only ever really used in this movie. And so you don't get as much of them as you get like Zaku's and stuff like that, but they are fucking great. Yes, it is. And it's one of the good things about Crossbone Gundam is Crossbone Gundam does get to reuse a bunch of these and it has new stuff as well. And then it also with the titular Crossbone Gundam mixes the F-91 and the the main like force from the uh from the crossbone vanguard and like puts them together like peanut butter and and chocolate and it's fucking great um and yeah so these are these are probably my favorite mech designs behind the original series i think if i just hold them up to like I, and i love all the other ones but i would put these above zeta double zeta shars counterattack in part because it's if especially if you go chronolo chronologically by release this is kind of the first time they've made a clean break and tried to start over you know because mm -hmm. all the way up through shars counterattack you're still building off of what's come before and this time it feels like especially for the crossbone vanguard they're really trying something new. And for the F-91, when we meet that Gundam, it's the first Gundam that feels like it's really trying to break from the original RX-78. You know what I mean? Absolutely, yeah. That's that's a good point. It's something that's like I forget about sometimes is that, yeah, when you place this historically, this is them kind of like resetting the plate for Gundam. So yes, while there are, you know, you see like a Zaku in the background of that museum scene, you see like the gun tank like Zeta Gundam, Double Zeta looking East thing they have at the beginning. Like there are a couple of things that are fairly reminiscent of, or like background shots using mobile suits from the old show. Um, most of the mobile suit designs feel very distinct. And I would agree that the Gundam F-91 um, is the first Gundam design that feels like, it's not a clean break because it is still a Gundam, but it's the first one that feels like a, this is it's very much its own Gundam. This is not, we are like, you know, in the lineage of the original Gundams. In fact, it technically isn't a Gundam in the sense of that it was not designed as the Gundam F-91 within the fiction. It was just called the F-91, and then it looks like a Gundam, so they call it a Gundam um, in in that scene. She says, like, oh, it looks like that old whatever. It's got oh, a face, it specifically, a is that they're like, oh, this one kind of has a face. Didn't that old suit that had a face, didn't we call it a Gundam? And that's why they do it, yeah. Yeah, and so there's a very conscious decision, I think, to try to make things feel fresh and new. Um, and part of that, it comes from also this is the first time in Gundam stuff that we, that we have talked about on the show where the Zeons are not involved at all. Yep. There's no Zeon, like it's not mentioned, they're not present, like presumably, you know, that whole thing like the Xeon government and people and stuff have just kind of like dissolved into the like, you know, diaspora of space noids or whatever of the Gundam universe. So, you know, we have never like seen that before. We've never seen what does Gundam look like when you don't have the Xeons. And the Rona are obviously like Xeon inspired, but they are less not, it's like they're, they're, you know, there's a sort of like Nazi aristocracy spectrum that the Gundam villains hang on. And the Zeon and Zabi people were definitely aristocratic, but they're more on the Nazi end of the slider. These guys are much more on the aristocratic end of the slider. So there's a very sort of like noble kind of gilded quality to a lot of their mobile suit designs, especially the, like the fancier um, sort of like commanders and stuff that they have like cloaks and, well, and, and I don't think a lot of these have like actual full cloaks, but they are like very like tall and like like very straight backed and like very like proper prim you know like British gentleman almost kind of um, mobile suits and they, and they have that feel to their design and in, in both in their weapons but then obviously like their massive mansion that Cecily's taken to and all of that um, that gives this. Um, which is something that is also a similar concept that is shared with Victory Gundam. It gives it its very own feel that it's attacking classism um, much more directly than it is to, like tackling more kind of broad ideological warfare and stuff like that. Yeah. And I have to say, Sean, the mech designs in F-91 are so good 
that it's actually been something that's held me back a little bit from getting fully into Victory Gundam because mm -hmm. um, just... I have watched some of Victory Gundam. I'm, I'm a little ahead of where we're recording. I've watched about 15 or 16 episodes of Victory Gundam. I slowed down because I because you basically told me to. You were like, Jonathan, slow the fuck down. I want to watch it too. Um, so and and I like Victory Gundam a lot. It conspicuously to me has the least interesting mech designs um, of anything. I've I think seen. I would probably agree with that. I, it it like gets they get. They go places with some of those mech designs later that okay. we'll, obviously we'll talk about with Victory. But yeah. yes, I, I would agree that overall Victory does not, especially compared to um, F91 and like the original sort of Gundam saga, I don't think it's as good as those. No, and, and like overall Victory Gundam, I think if you put it up right next to F91, it feels like a little bit of a poor substitute for what we could have gotten with a full F91 series, but it has many good things on its own to recommend it. We'll get into that in the next episode, obviously. Um, but yeah, I just like F91 is for all the story messes, like we're going to keep coming back to this. It's list of superlatives is pretty huge. And I would say having the best mechs since the original series um, is a big one for me, certainly. And now that I, I can say I've seen at least some of every universal century thing, it's the best in Universal Century other than the original, easily. I wouldn't put anything on par with F91. I mean, it's so good. Like, the the F91 is my favorite Gundam outside of, like, probably the, the Mark II in, in Zeta. It's it's really mm. good stuff. So, and we'll talk yes. about the F91 more later when it is very haphazardly <laughs> introduced into the movie at the 50-minute mark. Exactly, yeah. So, um, the, the, one other thing really quick I love about the opening is I love, because I had kind of forgotten this, Seabook just gets fucking shot. Yeah, no, he, he just, just gets, gets shot with a pistol. Like, Jesus That Christ. scene is fantastic because he goes looking for Cecily and Cecily is like the, the it's uh, Trunks from DBZ. Takeshi Kasau voices her brother, the guy with purple hair, who is one yeah. of the Ronas, who I kind of, that's another reason I, I miss, I want to go to the alternate universe where there was a full TV show where Takeshi Kasau would have probably voiced a Garmazabi-esque villain for like 10 episodes because he's yeah. really good in this. And this I think this would have been a pre-Trunks role because this is 91 and I don't think Trunks comes on to DBZ until 92. Um, but it's very obviously Takeshi Kusao. He's really good. And that scene where he's trying to get Cecily to come with him is really interesting. And then, yeah, um, it winds up, I think it's Theo, Cecily's father, who shoots uh, Seabook. And it's just, yeah. it's a visceral, because he opens the cockpit to try to talk to her and he just gets fucking shot. And it's part of why they do a time jump is to realistically go far enough ahead that he could be back in the action five minutes later in the movie. Yes, yeah, because yeah, he gets shot and then they kind of pull him into the lifeboat and have to like cut his like jacket open and try to like, you know, attend to some first aid as they're trying to get out into space. It's just, the, yeah, the whole opening is so hectic and frenzied and desperate. There's also the um, whole thing with his father who is helping them along the way. And I really like the father character. He's in like 10 minutes total of the movie, but I really like him. And then... While Seabook is shot and unaware, his father is opening the gate to like let the, the hatch to let them out of the spaceport. And then his dad is about to come back in, sees a little kid on the other side of the glass, goes back for the kid, and then everything goes to hell. And we don't we don't see the father again until later in the movie. It's kind of like what happens with Amaro's dad, where he's like sucked out and we don't know what's going on. Um, yeah. So it's just yeah, it's just like chaos layered on chaos layered on chaos. But it is so f such finely orchestrated chaos, like. At no point in those opening 26 minutes, I think, are you confused about what is happening, what the goal is, where where are the different people? Like, it is some of the best directed animation I've ever seen. Yeah, absolutely. It is, It is like, 10 out of 10 must see, like, phenomenal. Like, that's, like, one of those is, like, I could see maybe not showing someone all of Gundam F91 if they hadn't seen Gundam before. You can show them, like, the first 25 minutes of this movie and... Yeah be like and now go watch other stuff and then come back and finish this movie later because from this point on it'll get very confusing but that first opening bit is so fucking good um it's... and i was very glad like watching it that it was as good as i remembered because i had remembered like this this and like the ending like five minutes of f91 were the things that had stuck in my memory most of the middle of this movie would just had turned to mush because it is so chaotic there's like nothing for me to hold on to 
Um, but that opening 25 minutes or so in the last like five to 10 minutes of the movie, I have like very clearly in my mind and watching it again, I'm like, yep, I remember like everything about these sequences because they are so perfectly directed, orchestrated and realized through animation. Yeah, and it was it, it had only been a month for me. Obviously, I, I watched it twice in a, in about a month, but it was kind of the same for me. I would say it was the first twenty five minutes and the last twenty five minutes are like the A plus stuff I remember, and then the middle is like. Although I will say I enjoyed the middle a hell of a lot more on second viewing. I think there is, yeah, consistently a ton of phenomenal stuff in the middle. You just you have to kind of meet the movie where it's at, which is that they didn't quite get to make the movie they wanted to make, right? So. Yeah. yeah, and it is something that, like, on, on multiple viewings, it is much better because you kind of know what to expect, you know what to focus on, you know where the movie's going, so you're like, okay, I can, like, the on first viewing, there's so much information presented to you from this point forward from where we are talking about the movie. It's like, if you have no sort of, like, filter, trying to parse that information make sense of it is very difficult to do. What's funny to me is that, you know, we, uh, on episode six of Weekly Suit Gundam, we talked about the trilogy of movies uh, where they recut the original Gundam uh, into mm -hmm. three movies in 82 and 83. And, you know, the first movie of that also is like 13 episodes put in a blender, right? And it's, yeah. it's funny, that one is like manifestly so much better at just presenting it in a way that feels like you're watching a movie. And... Uh, I feel like it is like the weakness of this movie is conspicuously the script. And I do feel like there's a lot of stuff in the middle where you can say Tomino should have killed more of his darlings. Like there is just clearly like character threads and things he should have pulled out of this script to give more time with other things in the script. Like we'll get to it, but there is a character named Anne Marie that is the most <laughs> baffling thing in the whole movie to me that that is there. Um, because it's clearly a multi episode arc that was cut down to about five minutes and they try to do a whole character intro arc and death within about 10 minutes of screen time. And no, I am not exaggerating about that length of time. It's, I mean, yeah, it's basically if you tried to do a two hour movie out of Zeta Gundam and you tried to keep Rekoa in there for the whole yeah, thing. Yeah. And it's like, that's not a character arc that works without full attention to it. Um, and but like, it's one of the things that I love about this movie is it's just like, because because partially it is working, you know, you've seen so much Tomino stuff and Gundam stuff at this point. It's still working within that wheelhouse that like. You can fill, you can very easily fill in all the important blanks with the Anne Marie and like most of the things in this movie. Like I know what they would have done basically in a full TV show because it would have been here's like this variation of this trope or this archetype with these kinds of characters. Um, and so there's something very entertaining of like, okay, I see what they, I see how they're kind of inverting this Rekua type character. Cool. <laughs> like yeah. I, I get it. I would have liked to see the fully realized version, but I can just get enough of it from like the core pitch they're showing me here. Yeah, so before we dive into that middle hour and all the stuff they lay out, I do want to go back on kind of how it uses Gundam tropes is really interesting to me. And I, mm -hmm. I'm going to try to count the ones sort of like I saw, but um, I'm, I'm curious if you would add more. Like it's got, you know, just things that are there in the original show as well. It's got a protagonist whose parent designed the Gundam. It's got a yep. rookie officer who becomes the captain of a ship full of amateurs. It's got a female co-lead with secret ties to space royalty. It's got a charismatic villain who wears a mask. Um, and I'm yep. sure there's other ones. But, like, it, it very clearly does. And, and, like, consciously, it is not ripping itself off. It is Tomino doing what he likes to do, which is remix elements. And so it is sort of all the big check marks from original Gundam. And some of them, I think, get a very compelling explication in this movie. I think the number one is Barrona as sort of our Sela slash Shar stand-in. I think they do that fantastically with some gaps here and there. Um, whereas stuff like, and like, I like the dude in the mask as a villain. He never really becomes a character beyond that. Um, whereas like the stuff with like Sea Book's parent having designed the Gundam is one of the more thin parts of the movie, you could say, I think, fairly. Yeah. Yeah, because it is, because what it is, is it's using those tropes, which are like, because it is interesting to think about that at this point, they they are tropes, but they have but they're only tropes that like Tomino has effectively used. Um, and so from this point forward, these are things that in every basically ongoing Gundam show they will take like three maybe of like those five or something. You know, like they like not every Gundam show does every single one of these. Most Gundam shows do most of them, um, but try to find different twists on them. But this is like the first time with this kind of like fresh 
plate that it's like Tomino kind of doing that with his own work. And so there's no, like, you don't have to do the princess character in Gundam. Just most Gundam shows do the princess character that's set in by Sayla in the original show. And, and here I like that they do, again, you get very little of it actually realized in the movie, but the concept of the princess love interest character then being the rival ace pilot is such a good idea for a Gundam show. It really is. That is, is that Victory Gundam sort of uses it, it uses it in a different way with the Katejna character. They do different stuff with it, but it's like they kind of remix that idea a little bit, but but it's but they but it is different than what Cecily's would have been. Um if that had been a full show, um like that's something that's like I would have loved to have seen that arc realized um over multiple episodes and seeing that kind of more fully develop. And then I also really like the idea of the, like, reconciliation of the Gundam parent in the Gundam pilot. Yes. You know, like, th that's something that you just, like, very rarely see. Usually it is the, like, well, this fucking, this relationship is incredibly destructive and toxic for different reasons. And most times the Gundam parent thing just doesn't work out whether whether even if they are the designer of the Gundam or not if they're just the parents of the ace pilot usually that's just like it's a bad relationship in different ways or or if it's a good relationship they just get murdered tragically at some point um or it's Zeta here, and the care the main character has to watch them both die within the first five episodes exactly um here I really like the the mother character again you don't get much with her but she, her, like, relationship to Seabook and Reese, Seabook's uh, sister, and, and, them, and that kind of reconciliation where she kind of comes around, it is, you know, basically what if Amuro's mom had been the one to invent the Gundam instead of his dad, and then what if his mom had come back and kind of seen the value of what Amuro was doing as a soldier instead of just, like, you know, crying and falling onto her knees on the beach and, like, seeing how that character arc would develop if they had been stuck together for longer. That idea is so good. This movie doesn't get to, like, explore every facet of the idea. They just do, like, the bullet point version of it. But, again, as a Gundam fan, it's a heck of a good pitch for what would be a, like, fun inversion or playing with that kind of archetype in, in a Gundam show. Oh, 100%. And I, I think... The like I said, I think the Cecily side of that feels more fully realized in the movie. Yeah. And the mother thing kind of is a it's it's all sort of done in one scene that I think is is good, but it's good more for the potential of what's on display than what you're actually watching, which feels a little undercooked. Um Yeah, the mother has a change of heart very, very quickly. Oh yeah. It's 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 uh it's basically coming home to change of heart within five minutes. Yeah. So, I mean, not even five minutes. It's within one conversation, uh, which is a, yeah. it's, and it is a good scene. And like you talked about, like the idea of the love interest princess as also the rival pilot. That scene, like the big battle where all of that takes place in, is one of the best Gundam battles. Just like straight mm -hmm. up, it's one of the best. Is it as good as if we had had the full twenty episode arc doing that? Probably not. But it is like a great thing to have. You know, it's a uh, it's a movie like of unbridled potential, basically. You know. Just over and over yeah. again. And, you know, uh, Iron Mask Car Carozo, or however you say it. Um, yeah, Carozo, yeah. He, uh, again, not as much maybe depth or, like, the, the political dynamics of him versus the Rona family are so interesting and they don't fully get explicated. But god damn is that mask cool. God damn is the voice actor good. And that scene where he's given the big speech in the snow on the colony is really fucking great. And he and he has one of the coolest evil mobile suits ever. So, like, he comes out of this looking pretty good, too. I mean... Yeah, Iron Mask is one of those... Yeah, because let's just, like, I think we, now we should kind of dig into the Rona side of things. Because that's kind of where the plot goes. Yes. Now is like, Cecily... As well, I love that they romanize her name as Barra Rona when it is so clearly supposed to be Bella Rona. That is 100% what her name is meant to be. Like, I don't have any idea why they did romanize it that way. It's like it's so from, obviously from Zeta, right? Yes, yes, it's, it's it's Lieutenant Emery. It's like, you mean Emily? Like, come on, guys. We you're <laughs> like taking a name that already exists. Like, just romanize it into the name that it's like. So I'm just going to call her Bella Rona because in my head that is what her name is. Because that's what it sounds like in Japanese. Calling her Bera is just, that's not what her name is. Um, so yeah, so Cecily gets kidnapped, um, taken, and she's, you know, you find out. This whole, like, 
really complicated situation that is something that I feel like would work really well in a TV show that they probably should have like cut a couple of steps out for the movie version and kind of <laughs> simplified it because basically Bella Rona is um, the heiress to this like extre- extremely wealthy, powerful, aristocratic family that are the Ronas with the, the sort of patriarch being this old dude named Meitzer Rona, who is her grandfather. Meitzer Rona has a daughter um who what's her what's her name what's the mother's name oh, i don't remember Nadia. so he has a daughter named nadia um nadia marries Corozo before he turn, puts on the iron mask um but she sort of doesn't like the incredibly elitist uh philosophy of the rona family which basically you know you have that great scene with meitzer and uh, cecily where he's like you know, oh, like, you know, where she, she says, like, wait, do you believe that people aren't equal? Because you're going on and on about, like, the responsibility of the elite and how we're going to rule over everything. It's, it's like, no, it's I, people are equal in their human rights. But those who have wealth and power, like, need to be the people on the front line that will shed their blood and be noble. And it's like him presenting this very sort of, like, gussied up idea of like basically feudalism or also something at some point is what he's like advocating for but in this very pleasant way um like, actually thank you, can we hold on that scene for just a second okay because yeah. it's, it's a really great scene i love how it's staged it's directed on like their big estate on the colony um i've been reading and i know you've read this sean tomino's gundam novelization yeah. um we're, we're gonna do a whole episode on this at some point but um this is the three volume novelization tomino wrote concurrent with the original anime so it's like an alternate a very alternate telling and what's so fascinating about it is that it's basically become a story bible for gundam ever since like gundam productions on to today like unicorn gundam and narrative just take things from this book because it laid out so much of the gundam philosophy and I actually, Tomino does it himself in this scene because some of how Meitzer describes aristocracy feels like it's culled right from some of the descriptions of Degwin in um, the original Gundam novelization, where the original Gundam novelization has a slightly different take on the zombies, um, and it feels like these guys are sort of based on that slightly different take that um, I think Tomino had at one point. So I just loved recognizing that because it's really fascinating. Yeah, and, and it's that thing of where you can see how, like, Meitzer is, like, incredibly persuasive, and it's like he presents this very pleasant vision of the world where the people who are, you know, impoverished don't have to worry about it because the wealthy will just take care of them is kind of, like, how he, he sort of portrays it. And obviously, in the real world, that's not how that actually works at all, but it's a nice idea. Trickle-down um, economics, right? Exactly. Yeah. So he's so Meister, basically Ronald Reagan. Yes, he's he's Ronald Ronald Rona, uh, Meitzer Rona. He's he's yes, he's the weird trickle down patriarch of of this aristocratic family, and so he has. So yeah, so Meitzer is the sort of patriarch of the family. He has that philosophy kind of like sets it in stone. Um, Nadia doesn't like that so much, although Kurozo seems to kind of get like is like yeah sure cool that like power great awesome. Um, so she so Nadia. I, I can never kind of figure out whether or not she actually elopes with Theo or if she uses that as, like, cover for her to take Cecily and leave. I have no idea if her and Theo actually had a romantic relationship or not because it's, like, hard to tell. Do you have strong feelings one way or another on that? Uh, Sean, I've watched the movie twice and I'm actually not 100% sure who Cecily's father is. Is it Theo or is it Carozo? <laughs> Her her biological father is Carozzo. Okay. So so she like grew up probably to be like five or six living with the Rona family until Nadia, her mother, said, I don't like this. I'm taking Bella, then gonna rename her as Cecily, like away from this life and leaves with Theo. The part that I'm always like confused by and I feel like this is left like open on purpose, probably. Like I imagine the TV show would not have like given you would have given you reasons to sort of believe both because it feels purposeful for how vague it is. But I can never quite pin down whether or not Nadia actually has a relationship with Theo or not. Either way, I, they leave. Because oh, yeah, my reading ahead. is that Theo is just a power-hungry asshole. So I think they—I yes. don't think they had a relationship because Theo's whole goal in this marriage is to get closer to power, right? Exactly, yes. So she leaves with Theo um, and, and takes Cecily with her to, to go raise somewhere else. At some point, she leaves entirely because it seems like she kind of figures out that Theo's maybe a scumbag. It probably she wants to stay away from Cecily as a way to probably protect her more. Um, and then eventually, 
the Ronas figure out where Cecily is. They get in contact with Theo. Um, Theo then like helps them uh, get her so that he will have more access to power and be closer to the Rona family and get in their good graces. And that is how Bella Rona became Cecily Fairchild and then comes back to be Bella Rona again. And it's like such a complicated fucking setup that again, in a TV show, I can see how you could lay all those steps out in a way that would make sense and and would be effective because it's complicated enough that you can spend lots of plot time sort of having that stuff unravel for you. In a movie, that whole thing is just like, holy shit, like there's so many weird steps that leads to like your question of, is she actually Kurozo's daughter or not? And I'm like 99% sure that she is because there's a flashback of Kurozo without the mask on and Cecily being a child that's like, flashbacks generous it's like a couple of like still frame shots of her remembering her childhood but yes it is like the whole cecily situation and how she gets in with the ronas is incredibly complicated and presented to you in a very very dense manner because um, basically what happens is you have that first 25 minute section we said then you have this beautifully lyrical transition i love this moment where it's it comes in with the song from the end the Oh, eternal wind yeah eternal wind and it plays like the first minute of eternal wind and it's basically just you see the space cab that seabook and everyone are on gets away you see cecily be brought to the ronas you see the ronas are basically rebuilding and colonizing the the colony that they just blew up um or that they just attacked and then you get the big info dump basically through a conversation she has with Carozo and then with Meitzer. Um, and that's where you start to realize, oh shit, this movie is trying to bite off more than it can possibly handle because you have so much thrown at you so quickly. And yet those scenes are still really good. I think Carozo's introduction and his whole thing about like, I will wear this mask until I have like, paid off my shame until I have realized Cosmo Babylonia instantly makes him a pretty compellingly motivated villain. And like they, like there's some of that that I can imagine that exposition actually would have played worse on a TV show if they had to be coy with it for longer. It mm -hmm. plays pretty well, especially on a second viewing. Yeah. There's something about how like upfront he is with offering up all this exposition. Um, because I do, like, I love Iron Mask. I think he is a great villain. Like, with, there, it's particularly at the end, there's, like, that big leap um, with him, like, where apparently he's a cyber new type, and that's just, like, something that is revealed in one sentence in the last ten minutes of the movie that somehow Cecily's like, you're just angry because you're a cyber, you got turned into a cyber, a cyber new type by grandfather. It's like, okay, I guess that, that's information that you had access to at some point that I guess is a thing. Um, but other than some of that stuff at the end that is like, you know, feels like, oh, this would have been a lot of stuff that you just had to compress into basically a sentence of exposition. Iron Mask's presence as this guy who like, you know, he, he has this whole thing of like, I wear this Iron Mask to not show emotion, to control myself because part of like the philosophy of the Ronas is that they are like better than human. And it's not being new type exactly it's more like we are by our birthright and our power and our wealth we not only are we but we must strive to be above humanity and that means sort of like throwing away your emotions and passions and so his mask is a way of him sort of making that promise to himself in a way which i think is a really good idea especially for that villain where you know that that's not true that that's a lie um, and so he has that great scene early on with Theo where he kind of explains a lot of that stuff to Theo. Um, and he's putting on this like sort of like, oh, I don't care that you ran away with my light wife. Ha 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 ha. We're all good. That's it's fine. And you're like, you know that there's no way that a dude that's like seven feet tall and wears a giant iron mask is just going to let this dude get away with it. And so when that comes up again, when uh, Nadia comes back and she and Theo and Cecily and, and Iron Mask all have like that big conf confrontation in the hallway and Iron Mask sort of lays out his whole thing and then walks away and then Theo just collapses dead because at some point somehow Iron Mask poisoned or did something to kill him. You don't even really figure out or see what it is that he did. Like that to me does, is such a great condensed way of communicating the core things you need to understand about this guy of that he has this iron mask he professes these certain beliefs but he but he doesn't really care about them that underneath the surface 
like he just is angry and frustrated and is going to express that frustration in killing people and i don't ever believe that iron mask actually like sort of has a lot of faith in the mission that that my Sirona has about ruling humanity in space and all that kind of bullshit he just wants to sort of flex his power um and i think they just do such a good job of expressing that in the condensed way they have obviously it would be better if you could have had more elaboration and more focus and see it through different angles and through interactions with other characters but they do a like unbelievably effective job to me of getting to the core of what makes that villain interesting and what makes him tick in what is really like three or four scenes in the movie yeah absolutely and i think there's there's even more thematic depth here to me because especially seeing it on a second viewing i think the thing that tomino was most interested in with f91 and wanted to explore with the Rona family and the idea of Cosmo Babylonia is the notion of ideology versus emotions. Because they say that mm -hmm. several times. Like, our ideology is a belief in aristocracy. And to realize this vision of aristocracy, this Cosmo Babylonia that we think will be better, we need to sort of purge or limit our emotions to make sure that happens. And it's kind of interesting because the main contrast they draw is between two characters who I don't think ever have a conversation, which is Iron Mask and Zabine, the dude who is like the leader of the Crossbone Vanguard and has an eye patch and looks really fucking yeah. cool and is also a main character in Crossbone Gundam. Mm -hmm. um, and and Zabine, like, like, he goes... I actually think he might have the best arc of any character in this movie, but it's like very under the radar and it took me two viewings to realize because he is sort of following Iron Mask and he also has this philosophy of I need to put my emotions aside because my ideology comes first. And he even says this at one point because Bera calls him on it and he says, I don't agree with everything Iron Mask is doing, but we have the same ideology and so I just have to follow this through. And I think that's ultimately why we're going to talk about this character later, but Anne-Marie who is like his subordinate who defects and then all this stuff happens and he has to kill her. In most ways, I would say Anne-Marie should have been cut out of this script because it's a baffling left turn for the movie, except that it's really important for Zabine to have that moment where he's, he is like, I have to kill her because I'm killing that part of myself that puts my emotions and sense of right and wrong above the ideology I have bought into. And by the end of the movie, after seeing everything with the bugs and all that, Zabine his big character arc moment is he backs off and allows the space arc to go as a refugee ship and says, we'll fight another day. This was wrong, what Iron Mask does. He doesn't, like, join in the fight and flip sides, but he very clearly decides to let the heroes, like, get away with it because he has had a revelation. And Iron Mask is, like, the other side of that coin as the guy who puts the mask on, subliminates everything, and just makes himself completely subservient to an ideology to the point that he takes it further than anyone in Cosmo Babylonia thinks it should be taken. Like, clearly, Meitzer doesn't agree with him. Clearly, Zabine doesn't agree with him. Nobody agrees with the idea of the bugs. That's why he's developing it in secret, because his whole idea is we're going to kill nine-tenths of humanity or something and then make way for the, the, the Grand Master race. It's very much a play on the degwin Girin relationship in the original Gundam, but I think it's been taken to a whole other degree here in how it's talking about the extremities of ideology in a way that I also think is very interesting and relevant for our world today. And it's one of the things that watching F91 a second time made me love it all the more because that's all in there and it's really fascinating. And um, if we talk about Crossbone a little later, it's actually one of the few disappointments I have with Crossbone is I think they kind of misread Zabine's character in that way with where they take that character in Crossbone. Um, but it's really fascinating with how it all plays out in this movie, I think. Yeah, for me, Zabine's character, like, I have, like, it's hard for me to get, like, a grasp on really what they're trying to, because I, I agree that, like, everything you're saying is there, and especially, like, that is what the Anna Marie stuff is there for, is to show, like, the consequences of that existence of, like, trying to cut yourself off from emotions is that you manipulate and hurt people. Um, and push them um, in different ways and that has like negative consequences and it's to kind of punish him for that philosophy. Um, but like, I think the the sort of gaps between those little moments you get with Zabine because he's never a focal character of scenes. No. He's always like 
in the, the only time maybe is like a little couple moments at the very end where he gets a couple moments kind of to himself but generally he is like an accessory in a scene involving cecily um or iron mask you don't get like a lot of access to that character so it's hard for me to kind of go full into that reading because that's where one of, that's one of the areas where i think the gaps hurt the movie the most is with his character because it feels like in the tv show this would like he feels like a classic tomino character like he feels like he has that char esque like interesting complicated character arc that is like always below the surface that you have to like really dig into to analyze and that's where like when you have to compress that into a two-hour movie where he's not the focal point of the movie it becomes so broad and hard to interpret exactly why that character does certain things or makes certain changes that it's hard for me to like fully invest in that reading even if i do think it's there um for me what i read um is not just the like this is the dangers of like going so far with ideology to me it's like it is not possible to like it is not it is not authentic that he's going that far with ideology that he's he like iron mask and zabine are claiming that they're doing it for ideology but i don't think that they actually are and like iron masks putting on that mask like you put on a mask but you haven't changed anything putting on a mask doesn't make anything different you have just masked your emotions you haven't change the actual motivating factors behind them and it's him deluding himself to thinking oh i have fully committed myself to ideology instead of him just closing himself off from understanding the things that truly motivate him and that are pushing him to these incredible degrees that nobody else is willing to go well i don't think that's in conflict with my reading i think that's totally sure, yeah. like the end result kind of right like like you push something far enough then the motivations have changed right because ideology is an emotional result that reaction right you don't yeah. get an ideology like if you if you think you know poverty on a, and like if you think wealth inequality is really bad you don't just think that because you like analytically looked at the spreadsheet it's because you like lost your house in the financial crisis and watched a bunch of bankers get rich right like and it's an emotional reaction in part so i think that's there too i, th I think that yes it is it is about the the fallacies of a blind ideological push which is something that obviously Tomino is interested in a lot of these stories. Um, yes. So it's it's all there. And yeah, um, Zabine totally feels like a dry run for the character in uh, Victory Gundam who... God, what's his name? The, like, the rival... Oh, the... Yeah, the, the guy with the mask in Victory Gundam. Yeah, he's got a really cool name, but he totally feels like Zabine 2.0 in a lot of ways, the yes. way he's pitched. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. It's the yeah. same sort of character. Yeah. So yeah, a lot of good stuff there with the Rona side of things. Should we double back and talk about what happens to Seabook and friends? Yes. Um, so yeah, so then on the other side, Mobile Suit Gundam happens. Because yes. um, yeah, Seabook and friends find themselves on a ship called um, the Space Ark, right? That's the name of the ship. Yes, it's a great name. It's, it's uh, yeah. Space Ark. Yeah, so they find themselves on the Space Ark, which is being commanded by a lady named Lily Ediberry. I guess that's her full name. That's a fucking um, great name. Yeah, and she has a whole crew that, like, you get this, like... They're a this training is another... crew, right? Yes, this is where you have to pay very close attention to the specifics of what is being said because it is so easy to miss all these details of... It is basically the same situation that the White Base found itself in, that it was a, a crew that was meant to be training. Most of the experienced people have all been killed. So um, Leah Lee is your, our bright Noah. She is someone who's not really meant to be the commander of an entire ship, but here she is. And all the people piloting the ship are not really meant to be piloting the ship, but here they are. And then they have um, Birgit, who is the um, other pilot. He's basically the, the Ryu of the show. He's the other pilot that has like, he's not really actually like a fully experienced ace pilot, but he has more experience than anybody else. So he's the one who goes on all the missions. Um, and so Seabook and everyone just kind of find themselves on the show or on the ship ingratiated with the crew. Um, then there's, um, Cosmo Elgis, who is the guy who's like the, I'm the Federation guy who's mad. I, he's like basically like the chief of police in a buddy cop movie or something. It's also, like, oh, you damn kids. Also the most confusing element of this script is that there is an organization called Cosmo Babylonia and there is a guy in the Federation named Cosmo and they just keep saying Cosmo and you're like, which one are, like that was i cannot believe it made it through production with that because it is it would have been such an easy fix and it adds so much unnecessary confusion to the movie 
Yeah, it is. I I love it so much that they just fucking fuck it. Why not? Let's have let's have this dude just be named Cosmo um, and him go around and yell at people and and you know just get mad. Um, and yeah, and so that's where like this is where I feel like you would have had like. 10 episodes or something of just Sea Books here. He gets in the Gundam F91. He goes and sorties, fights a uh, crossbone vanguard thing. And there's some sort of story that plays out with the crew where you get to know a crew member better. Like, there's just like the whole chunks of episodes that probably would have happened here, like explaining all the crew. Cause there's like, there's like some lady who's like an engineer lady on the ship that with blue hair that seems cool that like. Seems like she would have been a really great character that you get like two scenes with, and you're like, oh, I guess she's almost out of the movie. And then she pops up in the background of like one shot later. Um, there's just lots of little things like that. The main point being that this is where the Gundam F91 gets introduced. We, wait a second. Um, Can I just say one thing yeah. about the captain? Because sure, yes, I, I think Captain Leili. It's an interesting case where part of I think why Tomino maybe thought they could pull this off is that they had fallen into a zone where. Bright, Captain Bright was a really effective shorthand for Gundam because you had Bright in every show and movie up to this point. And so you didn't really have to develop the captain, right? Because at a certain point, uh -huh. the captain is just bright and it just works. And then you get here and I want it. It's like it is so conspicuously undeveloped where like I want to see who that character is because it is the first attempt in Gundam to do bright but not bright. And that's very interesting yeah. to me. But part of it is that Ultimately, like, if they had found some really fucking contrived way to get Bright Noah on that ship, like, as an old fucking man, it almost would have been easier for the script because that's kind of how they yeah. treat her, is as the shorthand that you would have used with Captain Bright by the time of Char's counterattack, except, oh no, it's a new character, we can't do that. You know what I mean? Yeah, because there is, like, this thing where the movie tells you that she's, like, inexperienced in all these things, but she doesn't feel like no. that. She doesn't feel like original Mobile Suit Gundam Captain Bright, like, in over her head, doesn't know what's going on. She does feel like she, like, not, like, Captain Bright levels of, like, I'm the most important, like, the greatest captain in the history of military warfare. Um, But she, she feels like she knows what she's doing, and she's, like... You know, she's confident when being sort of, like, harassed by Cosmo and other people, um, second-questioning and second-guessing her decisions and stuff in a way that makes me really want to see more of that character. But, again, like, this is the... This is where the TV show would have happened. Yes. Because, again, we just had, like, basically, we had episode one of the TV show. Then you get what would have been, like, maybe half of episode two where you have Cecily uh, on with all the Ronas. And then the other half of episode two would have been them getting on the ship with these guys. And then episodes, like, three to twelve or something in a normal TV show, like, in the original Mobile Suit Gundam, would have been them learning all the stuff with the crew and getting in one episode fights and all that kind of stuff, right? And they skip all um, of that. And, yeah, they skip all of that. So then we meet the F-91, which I'll let you go. I just want to say, yeah, in most Gundam shows meeting the Gundam is a pretty big deal and it's like a pretty momentous event and I like that in F91 because of the crunch or whatever it's hey we've got this prototype on board what's going on here it's the most casual unveiling of a Gundam in any of these fucking shows yeah it is it is very again it was something that they would have done differently obviously uh, uh, otherwise but yes they have this prototype called the F91 that in an amazing, utter amazing coincidence, happened to have been developed by Seabook's mother. <laughs> so it's like, hey, here we go. Because this is one of the things that's like hard for me to understand sometimes about this movie is like the geography of what is happening, of like where characters are, which space colony they're on, where is is Seabook's mother? Was she on Earth when she was developing the F91? Was she on another colony? Like that kind of stuff is gets very confusing. Because what side are um, we at? Because it's all the frontier colonies, but I don't remember if they ever say what's like because that would help me locate uh, where we are near like the moon and Earth, you know? Yeah, I'm I don't even know if they ever actually say in the movie. I don't think which they do. They're, on. they're just they just say like yeah. Frontier One, Frontier because Frontier One and Frontier Four are the two big colonies. We start on Frontier Four and then they flee to Frontier One. But like they seem to be pretty close to the moon, but it's never made fully clear what the geography is of this film. Yeah, and yeah, I because I can't I don't see I'm on both the Gundam wiki and the normal Wikipedia page, and neither of them say which side we're at um 
because most of the victory Gundam stuff is all around side two. Um, so maybe maybe it's side two stuff. I don't know. Anyways, yeah. So like that's just like a weird one of those like compression things of the geography of where people are and when this is happening is always very confusing. Um, but yes, yeah, so Seabook's mom, we talked about that as she developed it and, and all that stuff happens with Cat's Cradle and all this shit about how eventually Seabook, it's, it is like a surprisingly protracted sequence of the movie of before they can actually get Seabook in the Gundam F91. Like in my head, it happened much earlier in the movie than it actually does, but there's just like a lot of weird stuff that needs to happen with like the daughter doing the cat's cradle and everything to figure out how the thing works yeah um for him to actually eventually get into the gundam it's about 52 minutes in before he sorties in the gundam for the first time yeah which which is just too long like it seems i, I don't understand why they had to do all that to get him to eventually be in the gundam it's just like that's like that's a place you can very easily expedite at this point in gundam it's like if we know he's going to be in the gundam you just have to give us like a decent enough reason for why he's in it um and we can go with it but yes he has his first sortie with the gundam he he does very well um i do like that this is also where you get the line um i think before he goes out into f91 where um someone says like oh no who knows you might be like a new type and his sister asks him like, see big brother what's a new type and he says oh it's someone who has like is naturally gifted at piloting and and i love that answer yes. Um, if that it says so much in that one sentence about where the universe is at this point of Gundam that it's like people have mostly forgotten the new type stuff um, is what it sort of feels like. That after everything we've been through, that obviously presumably people still are new types and that is something that is still happening, but people aren't as focused on it or obsessed with it now that Zeon is gone because Zeon was the entity that was most invested in the like ideology and narrative of the new type in pushing that forward and since we're with a group of people that are so divorced from all that that like presumably seabook like read that on the like you know universal century gundam internet or whatever you know it's like oh new type he read it on a forum or on like space twitter um it's like a new type they, they were really good pilots i think in, in that one war um yeah because i it makes it feels like this is a world where and this would be true of the chronological production the last significant new time of new type event was probably the um the big flash on earth at the end of char's counterattack, and for whatever reason new types kind of lay dormant since then maybe because there were no major wars you know yeah and that's and it says something about like you know that interesting thing in gundam of like are new types created through trauma and conflict and and warfare or are they just sort of developed naturally and and that sort of like interesting sort of back and forth that like some shows kind of do sort of push it more one side of it some shows push the other or they usually have characters debating it um like char definitely kind of felt like a character that oftentimes was felt like these new types particularly in like mobile z gundam are like seem to be created through warfare and our weapons of warfare and we should use them that way um before he kind of figures out a little bit better than that and yeah so these characters now that it's been in peace times for like 30 years or something i guess new types are people who are good with machines i don't know i don't know what a new type is and i love that answer i love that it's just like after all the like intense new type stuff you get through zeta double zeta and shards counterattack they hear it's like yeah, I mean, there's like one new type flash that he and Cecily have, and there's like that, like the sensing thing at the end. But other than that, the new type thing's not like a huge factor in this movie, and it's more kind of in the background, which I think is cool. Yeah, it's kind of a background reawakening. Um, I want to talk about this first fight scene he has, because it's about 60 seconds long, and I know that because the uh, picture that I'm sending out for this episode is a screenshot from this, so I was going through like frame by frame, but like he gets, him like launching off the ship to the end of that scene is about 60 seconds. It's very good. The F-91 looks fucking great in action. We can talk about that in oh, a second. Yeah. Um, and he, he winds up destroying, I think, three suits, including he has one shot where he takes out both of them, and this is the messiest transition in the movie, because he takes out both uh -huh. of them, and then he he it cuts to Seabook and he's like, oh my god, I've just killed two people. So the moment where the Gundam hero has to confront the reality of death. Then it cuts to Takeshi Kusao, the Trunks dude, who is the, the Garmazabi of, of the Ronas. And he's like, ah shit, we lost a bunch of dudes, let, let's retreat. Then it cuts to, completely inexplicably, you are back on um, Frontier 4 and Seabook is on foot looking for Cecily and he is at Theo's bakery that Theo has now abandoned and it's only about 
it's only later in the sequence that you learn he has taken the F-91, fled the ship, and gone to look for Cecily, but they completely skip that, meaning they go from him having the, oh my god, I've just killed someone moment, to what feels like three or four episodes later in the middle of an episode, like after the fucking, like, eye-catch break. It's, a, it's the weirdest transition in the movie. I remember when I first watched this, Sean, I had to rewind it several times because I thought I was missing something. Yeah, this, the, like, it's when this hits that it's, like, the, this is where, like, Gundam F-91 happens or whatever. Yes. It's like, like, oh, right, yes, this is the movie that was made out of, like, cobbled together from a TV show. Because, yes, you, you have the fight, which is a cool fight, great moment of him shooting the through one and hitting the other. It's like, oh, my God, I am I a murderer? And then, then it's just, like, harsh cut to, again, it would be, because that would be, like, something that would happen in episode two or episode three of the TV show. He gets in the Gundam gets his first fight, has to confront the reality of him murdering somebody. And then it cuts to like episode 14 or something. It cuts to, it cuts to Amuro Desserts. Yes. Um, where he, but, ha, but like the middle point of Amuro Desserts, right? So yes, if you skip the whole thing of him like having to steal the Gundam F-91 and, and getting back into the colony and all that. And yeah, you just go straight to him trying to figure out where Cecily is, going and meeting Cecily, all of that. Um, and then eventually getting back to the ship and everyone being mad at him. And that, in, like, because it's, it's the two things. It's the jump cut to, like, him going from, oh, my God, I'm a murderer, to I need to go find Cecily. And I'm already on the space call. He's like, that's a very sudden jump. And then him getting back to the space arc and everyone being mad at him because apparently he wasn't supposed to be there. It's like, I had no idea. I had no concept that this was, like, him going rogue or whatever was not in any way established implied nothing sets that up like he's not even at that point been with the crew of the space arc long enough for them to know him well enough for them to be mad at him like it's like every step of that is so confusing um that yes this is easily the most the most like jumbled part of the movie and sean this is the part where his dad comes back and dies <laughs> yep. so it's like there's so much going on there it specifically feels like if you took double zeta gundam and you jumped from like one of the first times judo is in the zeta and then cut to judo looking for his sister in the uh in the the zeon place like that would be yeah. such a massive shift and that's basically what they give us um and there's, there's a lot of confusing stuff here because the scene with him on Frontier 4 is he does meet up with Cecily and he does talk yep. with her for a couple of minutes. She ultimately decides to stay behind. She sends someone to try to find him, I think to try to keep him safe. He escapes with the help of his dad who re reappears fortuitously, let's say. And then while they're driving away, they get hit by a, by a rocket and his dad, they're kind of like jostled. And then it cuts to inside the F-91. He's got his dad there. His dad is hurt. And then they cut back to the ship. And his dad's dead. And Reese is sad. And everyone's mad at him. And I have to say, Sean, this was the first time I watched the movie. This whole part took me forever to get through. Because I could not figure out what killed his dad. Like, it literally, it took me three or four rewindings of, like, why is his dad here and why is he hurt? Because first, I have to be f frank, I didn't remember that was his dad. It, like, confused me going from, yeah. yeah. I was like, okay, so, so I figured out who the dude was, and I'm like, that dude is his dad. Then it was, like, what killed him, and I'm like, because in the, the it's one of the only parts of the movie I would question the direction of is the blast that hurt his dad. It looks like he just gets jostled a little bit. It doesn't look like a mortal injury or anything like that. So I was unclear that that is what hurt him. Then they're in the F-91 again, and I'm like, where did the F-91 come from? Because I wasn't clear that he took the F-91 and stole it and got to, the, got to the, the colony. And so it's just like every step of it, I kept rewinding, looking for answers. And it's like, they ultimately give you the answers in a little bit later. But I was just like, what the fuck am I? I didn't know what was going on. It was so confusing. No. Yeah, absolutely. Because then also I think this is where like like the the stuff with Cecily is also very confusing because it's like hard to tell has she actually like steeled herself and decided to be with the Ronas? Is she just pretending? Why is she sending someone after Seabook? Um, which again, this is all stuff that I could see in the TV show, all that working out of Cecily going through multiple phases of her character where she like acquiesces and decides to join the Ronas because she has this line to Seabook where Seabook's like, come with me. And she says, oh no, Seabook, why are you here now? You're already too late. Like it's too late. And it's like, well, why, why, why is it too late? Which like, 
again, I could. This is a, a kind of character arc I've seen before, but you need to sort of, you know, go through the process for it to be too late for her. Uh, um, and 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 then also, I feel like there's a whole thing skipped, which is. Cecily's basically responsible for Seabook's father's death. Yes. And that's something that never comes up, which I feel would have been like the basically the plot of an episode or something in, in the TV show. That's like their like Seabook and Cecily's relationship is probably the best part of the movie, and it is interesting and good, but like it's everything about this middle section is so jumbled and fragmented that you have to just sort of go along with it. Just ex just anything that is said by the movie, you just have to accept 100% and just move on and not think about it too much and just be like, okay, yes, it's too late. I can't go with you now. Then later it's going to be fine. You don't have to, you can't hang up too much on the reasoning for why all those shifts happen because the movie just doesn't have the space to be able to go into it. Yeah, it stuff. is the most confusing thing with Cecily is that she's at first like, it's too late, I can't go with you. And then when she rejoins the crew later in the movie, it's... I didn't know you were all alive. And I'm like, wait, what? But you did. You met, you met, see, it's, it's, there's, it's nonsensical. It does not make sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I agree. So yes, yeah. yeah, so you have that whole section. And then I don't even fully remember what the next step for the main crew is at that point. Cause there's so much in the middle of this movie. Yeah, because then, like, this is where a bunch of scenes happen with um, Cecily and her, like, learning she's becoming a pilot, and um, uh, this is where a lot of the, uh, what's her name, the Anne-Marie? Anne-Marie. Let's talk about Anne-Marie for a uh, second, Sean, because this yeah. is, there's there's kind of two big fights in the middle section of the movie that overlap, and it's, because the driving force here is the space arc is trying to get off of Frontier 1 and is encountering resistance because... Um, Takeshi Kusao guy, I do not know his, I should probably look up his name so I can stop saying Takeshi Kusao guy, but, um, uh, it's Doral, Doral. okay, so Doral, Doral Rona. Rona comes out a couple of times on, on Frontier 1 and is wondering why they don't attack it, that whole thing is not really fully developed, um, and then you have Zabine who is kind of training Bera and they're gonna go out on missions together, Anne-Marie you see in the background of a couple scenes and then at one point, um, there is a, I think they're fighting Doral, and and as they're doing that, an enemy suit is being brought in, and that's, and, and uh, Seabook is confused, and he tries to shoot it, and then they're like, no, 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 she's with us, and that's when you see that Anne-Marie has defected and has brought this mobile suit with her, and this is when you get the the most F91 part of F91 is the Anne-Marie arc, which is this woman who has, who we basically have not met or been like formally introduced to, defecting, going on like an internal journey, and then confronting Zabine and getting killed all in the span of about 10 minutes. And it is an arc that would be pretty familiar if you saw it in a TV show where it got to be over like 10 episodes. It is kind of a Rekoa in reverse sort of thing. And it's... But it's very, it's very weird. The whole thing is very weird. Yeah, because basically you, you, you have, I think, two very brief moments with Anna Marie earlier. Like one is because, but the thing is that she's never the no. focus of those scenes. It's always like they use her like viewpoint in order to do exposition for Cecily. And so it's when Cecily first kind of gets out of the mobile suit and the Zabine is there and it's like, okay, she's being trained to be a pilot and all that. Like that's what this scene communicates. Like, she's there, Anna Marie is there looking at that and says, like, oh, why do we have to, like, why are we delayed for 10 minutes or whatever because of some rookie pilot? Oh, she's one of the Ronas. Okay. And then in a later scene, it's her, um, Zabine, and Cecily. And it's her, like, Zabine and Cecily are going to go out in the mobile suits and Anna Marie is there. And, and she was, like, talking to Zabine and then Cecily comes up and there's just this, like, lingering shot on her that is meant to imply, like, oh, she has the hots for Zabine. And then the next thing you see is that they are bringing in the small suit and Anna Marie is in it. It's like, like, like the literal bullet points of the character arc are technically there. It's like, she, she likes Zabine. She's jealous of the Cecily thing. She decides that it's not worth it. It's just, she defects and then she fights and then she gets killed by Zabine. It's like, like one, like the one, two, three, four plot step is there, but it is like they literally are all developed or they're all delivered in single individual scenes where she's never the focus of any of them. And so it is like the most confusing shit. It is, it is the most just like, 
this is the the most like in a compressed blender version of this character arc you could possibly make with technically having all the pieces still be there in some and form. i don't know if i fully agree that all the pieces are still there in some form because what it is that drives her to defect i don't know and if it really is just she's jealous of cecily that doesn't fully make sense for me and i don't know if it even tracks with like the sort of thematic arc of zabine and the movie it's it's very weird like i think because at this point you're also starting to get the hints that like Zabine is not fully read in on what Carozo is planning and he's uncomfortable with that. And I feel like what they kind of, if they were able to fully explicate it, Anne Marie would be uncomfortable with that too. And like be a little like scared of what they're planning in Cosmo Babylonia. And that's maybe why she defects. But we just, we do not, yeah, it's, it's so fast. And then... It's it's the first battle she has with the new crew. She gets killed. And her death scene is fantastic. The, the scene between her and Zabine yeah. is really good and, like, incredibly well animated, um, as all the scenes here are. But, yeah, it's nuts so Especially because while they're doing... A, every scene has to be doing five or six different things. And ultimately, every scene yep. has to be about developing Seabook and Cecily because the movie wouldn't work at all all if you didn't get to the end and care about those two and it, you do get to the end and care about those two the movie does its job but like it, it, it ultimately you can't have any scenes that are just about Anne marie or zabine or any of these people because it is still more important that we get seabook and cecily built up enough to devote a good five minutes at the end to those two you know yeah i i will say i think the other piece for the for Anne marie's arc of why she defects isn't just that she's in love with Zabine. I think it's also, it's the, that Zabine is, or at least she, she says basically that Zabine is only with Cecily slash Bella Rona in order to get closer to the Rona family to have that power. And so I think it is like, for me, what Anna Marie's thing is supposed to be, if it had been fully fleshed out, would be the like, oh, like you're like, like she understands that she can't actually go up in yeah. this system that she's stuck right that she is a commoner in this like rigid aristocracy and she sees the way that zabine who is more wealthy and has more power is like gaming that system to try to go higher and so she has one no hope of ever being with him but also like sees that it's like oh that means i have no hope of going anywhere yeah. i'm stuck basically and I, that's like what it's supposed to be again that is something that is said literally in a line of dialogue like probably 30 seconds before she yes. gets killed. So it is, it is, it is, when I say the pieces is there, I mean that in the most broad way possible. But also, the big battle that happens here, where you've got the F-91 in action and everything, that's so fucking good. It's so fucking good. Oh, and, amazing. And, the, and like mm -hmm. how Bera is, is involved in the fight and how she and Seabook meet up and like, as nonsensical as it is for her to be like, I didn't know you guys were around. I'm like, that's all it took? That's all it took, Cecily? I'm not sure what's going on here, Cecily. It it just, it's so well produced. It's so well directed. The music is so good at this point. Like, you are so swept up in the opera. Because this movie, I think, more than any other piece of Gundam, operates on a level of space opera, kind of in a star, and very mm -hmm. self-consciously in a Star Wars way. We'll talk about that later. Yep. That you're just kind of swept along. And it, it really starts to... I do think like minutes 30 to 1 hour 10 minutes are the roughest part of the movie. Because I think it's where it loses a lot of momentum. But once it starts building that momentum back up, it's a pretty good sprint to the finish line. Yeah. And then this is also the battle where I think the F-91 starts to really shine as a mobile suit um because this is where he starts using the fucking like guns he has on the back of it that like come yep. forward under the arms which are very yes. cool um because this is also the scene where they have the explanation for why the mobile suits have gotten smaller um because yeah because the new gundam and all those mobile suits from Shars counterattack are like massive um and so the f91 and most of the crossbone vanguard mobile suits are scaled down um, compared to like the Jagan, which is a normal like 15 meter tall or whatever it is. Um, and and so they say there's like, oh, they're more compact, they're faster, they're more agile. And so that's the one thing I really love about the F-91 is the way it just sort of like zips around and you have all the stuff with like Seabook flying through the clouds and behind the clouds to get like around on people and, and get behind them and shoot them. That is so gorgeously animated, but it also is like a slightly different kind of action scene like the emphasis on speed 
with the new mobile suits um like really gives the action like its own kind of identity in here compared to most other um gundam things that i like a lot oh absolutely i agree let's 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 talk about the f91 for a minute sean it is Mm -hmm. it's one of my favorite gundam designs it um it's definitely up there with like i would say for me like the hall of fame for uc gundams is the gundam mark ii the double zeta gundam and then maybe for me um the crossbone gundam in in the manga but this would be right and and you don't have the crossbone gundam without the f91 because the crossbone is like a refit f91 um but the f91 is so good i love how small it is i love how compact it is i love how it feels so like you watching it it feels so thought out like where everything is like one little detail is the um the beam sabers have been moved from over the shoulder to down on the hip and he's got two right alongside near the hip and it's like pulls them out and use that's really great i love that it's not as angular as a lot of gundam designs it's got a lot of rounded edges and it just looks very sleek in that sense and then i love the chest piece and it's kind of like it goes out in a weird way and then it's got these vents on the bottom from which stuff can like shoot out as well and that looks really cool i think the balance of white to blue is just super sleek and the fucking letters the f on one shoulder and the 91 on the other are so fucking sexy i love it the f91 like every time i look at it i like it more it is such a good gundam design yeah it's and then i love like the backpack with the two guns that kind of come around the front and then the wings that like can kind of come out of the shoulder pads are like a i don't know what they're there for functionally but it's a very nice flourish and they look very fucking cool um especially in the last action scene where they feature a little more like prominently visually um yeah it's just it's a it's an all-time awesome gun design um i i particularly like what you said about it is the color balance of the white and blue like it has like the white is much much more prominent than most gundams um and so yeah it just has it it like looks very distinctive which is one of the things i like about it 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 has like the classic gundam head uh but the the body of it is very clear and so it's very easy to identify the f91 like if you had all the different gundam designs lined up i mean at this point i'd be able to probably identify most of them but there's a bunch of them from like gundam seed and stuff they're like "Ah, this is just kind of a gundam the gundam f91 you can spot out of like a lineup immediately because it looks very very clear has a very distinct silhouette and look to it the f91 is definitely on my list of gunpla i want to build because i want to have it to scale with the other ones just to see because i have heard the 1144th gun of f91 is a little hard to build because it's so small um compared to all the other ones but i would love to like put it in the lineup you know and you even have better ones to do it with because you have like the the new gundam from uh shars counterattack yes i guess i should build an f91 and put it next to my new gundam but uh, one of the reasons why they scaled up the mobile suits almost immediately again is because toy manufacturers are like guys um, these are really are like the like it was funny because part of one of the like sort of business reasonings behind it I think they wanted to make them smaller anyways but one of the sort of business justifications behind it was oh well then it's less plastic for the toys but then all the the manufacturing plants were like but we don't have any molds for parts this small we have molds for the parts that are relatively the size of the other Gundam things and they're like it's way more expensive to make these because we have to like, we can't reuse a bunch of the stuff that we can reuse to make Zaku's and Gundam Mark II's and all that kind of stuff. So then eventually they went back up to like the normal Gundam height for, for mobile suits. Uh, I think, I think victory Gundam still has the smaller ones, but G Gundam. Yeah. It's mobile fighter. Yeah. 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 It's very funny. It's very funny. It's a weird moment in Gundam history, but also like it's cool. And, uh, Gundam Crossbone Gundam has a re- keeps the small suits and it has a really cool added explanation um, because it also explains that with Gundams getting smaller and with beam shields get- technology getting better, which you see throughout this movie that beam shields are becoming a big thing, that long range weaponry like guns is just becoming completely obsolete and that's why in Crossbone Gundam there's such a focus on hand to hand combat and uh, th- it allows them to do all their little like weird pirate. Uh, iconography they do in crossbone gundam but it's one of my favorite technical explanations in that series so yeah yep. so we get that fight Bera comes back um well i guess she's not coming back she wasn't on the ship at all but she comes back to her friend group and they they paint her what's the name of her mobile suit it's got a cool name it's the um Vigna oh, uh, something uh, the 
Vigna Gina? Is that the one that is hers? I think so. Yeah, I don't remember how they actually say it in Japanese because I only have the English version here. Yeah. Yes, but the Vigna Gina. Yes, because she guess. has that and they paint it sort of white-ish or silver-ish or something mm -hmm. um, for the final fight. But yes, then it is we get into the final act and the final act is also incredibly good because this is where Corozo has his plan to use these things called bugs, which are actually these sort of big circular robots that look like basically evil Beyblades and they're going to go out and... <laughs> I never thought of it that way. That makes the bugs way less cool when you call them evil Beyblades. I'm trying to think I of like... something that listeners might know a visual reference for. They're just giant spinning death discs. Like, <laughs> what you, they need no... It's not like this hugely complicated thing that you need a metaphor to explain. It's a big fucking disc with blades and guns on it that murders people. That's all they are. I like evil Beyblades. I think that's funny. All right. So anyway, yes, the evil spinning death discs, and he is implementing them on a space colony as a test before they go on to do it on the moon and on Earth. And sort of the big final fight of the movie is trying to stop the 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 de the, the the bugs. And the scene where the bugs descend on the colony and start killing people is is on par with what you get early in the movie in terms of just the utter ruthlessness ruthlessness of Yoshiyuki Tomino. I think the most vivid image there for me, Sean, is there is a there's a father and daughter in like their apartment, and the father is like hugging the daughter close, like trying to hide from the the evil discs, and the bug comes in and kind of looks around, and you think they're going to be okay, and then it comes a little further, sees them, and just vaporizes them. And then moves on. Yeah, it's it's yeah. insane. This is this is yeah where the opening scene kind of comes home to roost, and there's just the like ruthless efficiency of the bugs. Like I think the bugs are a incredible like conceit for this movie. Yes. I think it's such a good idea of. It's like the ultimate end point of the mobile suits where people like he don't even have to pilot them anymore. They're just these like sort of very basic sort of circular shapes that just fly around and are programmed entirely to murder people. Like there's almost like something like vaguely cosmic horror about it to me of the, the, the facelessness in the lack of like the utter lack of sort of personality to the bugs is pretty horrifying. And, and there's just this massive swarm. So it also allows a very different kind of fight sequence where, um, uh, Seabook Cecily and the other guy are all fighting them. And then he gets killed. Birgit. Um, Birgit. Yeah. Birgit. This is where he, he meets his, his sad end at the hands of the, the evil Beyblades. Yes, um, but, but let me yeah. back up because they actually provide a pretty interesting explanation for why Corozo is using the bugs. Because the whole plan is that they want to get rid of everyone on Earth and the Moon so that they can inhabit those spaces and use the natural resources. So at first, like I think someone even says, so are we going to use poison gas to kill all these people? But poison gas would also kill the animals and it would... Like, it would uh, uh, kill, the kill the plants and it would pollute the environment they just want to kill the people so they have built these machines to like ruthlessly surgically go in and kill the people but cause minimal destruction to everything else and it is a it is a fascinatingly horrifying idea and i think the what it builds also just aesthetically is amazing because yes the, the battle sequence you have here where Seabook realizes the way to fight them is to just set his hand pieces to start spinning and they're spinning and he has a beam saber in each one and he's flying around super fast in this sleek maneuverable F-91 with his like hand units just set to like spin at a maximum frequency and they're just going and fighting off the blades from each side. It is one of the most breathtaking pieces of animation I've ever seen. Yeah, it's fantastic. And then one of the things I love about it so much as like a big Gundam fan is this is something that is like wholly unique to F91. Yes. There is nothing in the entire franchise that is like this again, um, which I don't think they should ever do. Like, I, I don't think you need to redo this idea because I think in some ways this idea works even better in this like weird dreamlike super compressed movie then I think it could... There are ways to do this that it would come across almost too cheesy if you saw them too much, but having them be the climax of this one movie as opposed to having like a whole arc in a TV show or something where you have multiple encounters with the bugs, having this just one big fight with them, they get to be like cool and scary and unique. Um, and, it's, and it's one of the things that's very memorable to me about this movie. Whenever I think about F91, I think about the opening, I think about the bugs, I think about Iron Mask because he's cool, two thumbs up, and then I think about um, like the last shot effectively of the movie. And those are all the things that have run through my head since I watched it the first time because the bugs 
just like have stood out so well for me because I think they're so striking in their simplicity, but so well executed um, in this this full big sequence. So good, it, and it really allows the F-91 as a design and a conceit to show off its best side. You know, like that fight sequence, mm -hmm. you couldn't do with the RX-78, right? Like you couldn't do it with a Zaku. You, it has to be this mobile suit to pull that off. And it's really cool. I like having Barra and Seabook in action together is very good. Mm -hmm. And then Carozo decides it's time for him to come out. And he's got the craziest fucking mobile armor we've ever seen. Yes, the Rafflesia, um, which is like, it, it feels like a um, like sane version of what uh, Full Frontal uses at the end of Unicorn Gundam. Yes. It's like, it's sort of like that, only it's not like the size of Godzilla or something fucking ridiculous. Size of Godzilla? I think it's the size of 10 Godzillas stacked on top of each other, Sean. <laughs> Yeah, full frontal thing at the end of the Unicorn Gundam is ridiculous. But yeah, the Rafflesia is this cool mobile armor that has like the new typey like here's like our like like I it's like it's the kind of bits that I really like that they're not just like floating in space but they're attached by wires. I always really like that when we get some of those like the Brow Bro. Um, oh, it looks Mobile very like Metropolis esque, where he's got all these wires coming out of his head. Oh, yes. It's oh my god, like because he's in the middle. We should describe the look. It looks like kind of like a a piranha plant that like opens up, you know. And and it's and in the middle of it is his cockpit surrounded by like a glass dome, and he's connected to all these wires. And then it's got these like arms that sort of open up, but it's not humanoid at all. And and it's got it's it's crazy. It's it's shooting stuff out of like every orifice. Yeah, it is it is like the most frightening version of like what if Dr. Robotnik could make something effective in Sonic the Hedgehog. Like yes. it's got that weird like dome thing that feels like a this is where you hit the enemy in the video game to do damage. Yes. Uh, Cuz I but there's something that is like feels so true to like I think Iron Mask like asked for it. I think he wanted like the glass dome that is fully exposed because that's not a thing that any mobile suit has no. or any mobile armor. They're all in like cockpits that are behind like the most armor. Like one of the reasons why the cockpits are in the chest of these things is because that's where all the like most heavily concentrated armor is. It's in the center. Um, and so you do, you want the pilot to be the least exposed possible in your mobile suit. And Carozo is just like, no, fuck that, man. I want to sit on, like in a glass dome with a bunch of, of all my wires in my head and like fucking techno lights going off. And just I want to be able to look into like the things that I'm shooting at with my own fucking eyes. Um, it's great. Like it's a it's a great, a really evocative design. Um, that also leads to just like an incredible action sequence that again levies the or leverages the maneuverability of the F91 so much. And this is where it's sort of famous like. What is one of my favorite versions of like the Super Saiyan Gundam where it's like creating after images because it's so fast now and Carrozo kind of can't keep up with it and he starts destroying pieces of his, of his own machine just trying to hit um, Seabook. It's it's a all time great, incredible like action climax for a Gundam thing. This this fight. It's so good and and I think the fact that the new type stuff is kept pretty under wraps until the very end makes it hit even harder especially compared to like how new type heavy some of the other Gundam stuff gets like um and I actually there's more new type stuff in the movie than I thought when I saw it the first time because there's even a moment earlier in the movie where when Barra and Seabook are going out to fight they're like oh what are we going to do to fight these and they have a flash and they realize but it's yes. all wordless it's actually a really artfully done moment that I just completely missed the first time watching it because so much is going on but yeah like like Seabook kind of doing some crazy new type shit at the end is nice because it, it feels like actually very organic for as many things like are unexplained or contrived because of this movie being kind of squinched into two hours the new type thing hits really hard especially because the ultimate climax of the movie isn't this it's finding Barra it's finding Cecily yeah. um I really love all of that but yes it's it's as good as a big final Gundam confrontation has ever been particularly just on the aesthetic level it's an incredible yeah, it's great. I love the basically like the I love that basically the last thing that Iron Mask sees is the I hadn't even thought about this. It literally it's the Gundam face with the mask is exposed because he like the F ninety one flies straight up into Kuroza's face. Like the the when he's in his super mode, the mask bit is off, and you see like the, like it's got almost like this weird mouth underneath in, on the F ninety one, which is where it gets its name. It's like from the scene where they comment on calling it the Gundam and then it like shoots a beam and then all of the beams from Corozo's 
um, mobile armor sh fire firing at the F-91 and it moves out of the way and he explodes. And so the last thing that Iron Mask sees is the face of the Gundam with the mask-like piece over the mouth taken off, which is very poetic. Absolutely. Tomino's a smart guy. We know this. Yep. Um, even if he's only got two hours to work his magic. It's so good. And then, yeah, the... The ending of this movie is so good. And it's so much it's better amazing. than it has any right to be. It's so much better than it has any right to be after, like, the compression of putting this all into two hours. But it just fucking works. I think this is where the mother stuff works best in her coming out mm -hmm. and supporting Seabook and using her knowledge to help him. And... And the direction of those final moments as he sees the flower. And it's like, that's what he's going to latch on to to find Cecily. And he gets on a vernier and he just propels himself out. And he grabs the flower as it's like wilting. And there's all this spinning imagery. Sees her spinning out in the void. I When I first watched this, I just took screenshots of every shot here. Because they're all so gorgeous. And the last image being them embracing, spinning together. Him calling for her. She says his name. And then it's like freeze frame on them floating in front of the space arc and the colony. Oh, my, it, unbelievably well done. One of the best directed sequences in any animated movie I've ever seen. It's perfect. It's it's incredible. Like this this ending, again, this is one of the things that to me has always stood out um, in F91. Even like where the, you know, the bulk of the plot has, is confusing and there's just large sections in the middle that on the first viewing several years ago just evacuated my brain completely. But that like final shot of them like, you know, embracing, as you said, spinning through space and not just the final shot, but the whole sequence of him moving through space and abandoning and like discarding the F-91 to go find her. Um, it's just, it's like etched in my mind as one of like the iconic images of Gundam because then this is also where um, Eternal Wind starts playing as it goes into the credits again and this is like it's a great song this is where uh, Hidoko Moriguchi the, who also did the second theme for Zeta Gundam officially like establishes herself as the Gundam lady because it's like oh they brought me back for another Gundam song now she's the Gundam lady and she's great and amazing it's a great song and, and it's like the perfect song for that moment because it's so gorgeous it, it's um, one of the best uses of music in all of Gundam it like the song is elevated by the visuals and the visuals are elevated by the song it is a perfect marriage of visuals and music yeah, and they dedicate what is like a solid basically like 10 minutes of the movie to this whole extended sequence, which is one of those things that you would, if you thought, or like someone told you, oh, they had to like take what was like 13 scripts or like 50 episodes, like this like broad idea for what is like much bigger story that would be a TV show and boil it down into a two hour movie. You would not, this would not be the thing that you would expect would be one of the things that like makes it through what feels like all the way uncut. Like, I would imagine that if they had done the TV show, this is what, like, the last half of the last episode would basically be. In the same way that the last half of the last episode of the original Mobile Suit Gundam is Amuro, like, guiding the other people and flying through space and, and all that. that happened. Like, it's a similar sort of thing that happens at the end of the original Mobile Suit Gundam. And this kind of, like, the opening 25 minutes just feel like this is probably just what the first episode would have been. This is probably what the ending would have been for if it was the TV show version and the balls to just say, you know, we could use that time on other scenes to explain more about the Cecily thing or Anna Marie or the Iron Mask or Zadine or like any of the other shit that's going on in this movie that is horribly underdeveloped. It's the choice is so right to say, no, this is this moment. This is what this movie is about is these two characters coming together. And yes, like the middle part of their development is very rushed and not all the way there. But if you can land this moment so artfully, it like makes me feel so like positive about the relationship developed between these two characters, even though like really there's not that much there, relatively speaking. This ending sells so much of that relationship that every time now that I've watched the movie twice, I get to the end and it's like Seabook and Cecily are like one of, if not maybe my favorite couple in Gundam of like a relationship um, a romantic relationship between two main characters. This is like, it's, you know, there are other couplings that are much more fully developed in other Gundam shows. This to me is like the iconic one that I think about. And, and it's impressive because again, again, the whole middle turn of Cecily doesn't even make sense in the movie. It, it is not justified in any way, but it's kind of in the scope of like what the movie accomplishes. It doesn't really matter to me at all. 
I mean, it's so... I agree, because I think this would have been the last 10 minutes no matter what they did. But I think it would have been the last 10 minutes set way after the actual action of what we get in this movie. Because mm -hmm. when they beat Corozo, if you really think about it, so little has been accomplished. Like, they got rid of this one guy in the hierarchy of Cosmo Babylonia and put to a stop the worst part of their plan. But the entire Cosmo Babylonia hierarchy is still there. There's still plenty of people to lead the Crossbone Vanguard. There's never a confrontation with Sabine. The The whole thing still exists. Like, this, this whole threat is still out there. When Crossbone Gundam comes back to these characters, it has to do one chapter where it kind of... where um, Seabook will tell you what all led them to this place because it basically has to explain what the sequel to F91 would have been to actually bring down the Crossbone Vanguard and all that. But I think Tomino is really smart in saying it's kind of character and theme over story, right? Like, like ultimately, yeah. like, yes, it would be nice to know how they stop the ultimate threat and all that, but like, the climax to this has to be Seabook and Cecily, two characters who have been looking for each other the whole movie, finding each other. It has to be that moment of human connection. That is what matters most. Let's end it, like, let's go to what we know matters most. And I think it's an example of a movie having its priorities very straight. It knows what it needs and wants to be, even if it's kind of hard to get there and it has to skip some steps to get there. It lands the, you know, it might have skipped some steps along the way, but it lands the final punch and it lands it so beautifully. I agree. Like, and I like it. It's so weird. I like this movie. The more I think about it, I like it. The more I watch it, I like it. The more I talk about it, like it, it, it went from being something that when I first sat down and watched it kind of baffled me to the more it, ex it inhabits my headspace, the more it is just one of my favorite pieces of Gundam. Yeah. It's something that like, I've always felt so warmly about this movie. And I think part of it is, is like this ending is like, one of like the most like just completely objectively like happy joyful moments this whole series like franchise has is there's something so like pure and kind of fairy tale about this ending this like almost like happily ever ever after kind of thing even though obviously it's not technically happily ever after there are other stories that characters will go through other trials and stuff um but this that moment of them like embracing behind the moon in space is like perfect and pure and in this whole movie just like it makes me very happy when i think about it and i was so glad to revisit it and just spend those two hours even though it is has some of the most horrifying violence in all of gundam it, i think it, it like balances it out so well by having this kind of ending because again like you know and we probably do it on this podcast but people give tomino too much shit for his kill em all tomino stuff because you know yes sometimes he will just horribly murder almost the entire cast of characters in his tv show that you've come to love but he will also deliver you like really happy warm like thoughtful deeply human um endings that that leave you like thrilled and joyful coming away from them not just sort of like depressed and hating your life i mean i think tomino across his work is much more of an optimist about humanity than he gets credit for um, yes, I agree. I don't think he's a pessimist about humanity at all. I think he's very realistic about the dark sides of humanity, but he is so hopeful about the potential of humanity, and that is ultimately the tension in his work. But I think he always leans on the side of that potential being there and, and being very real. And even in yeah. the darkest hours of like the end of Zeta Gundam, I think that potential is still a huge part of what that's about, you know? Um and and especially if you read like his original Gundam book, like you you it, it so shines through in that. Like he can't mm -hmm. resist talking about that, you know. Um, and I think F ninety one feels like one of those works that's coming right out of his id in that way, in that it's all on display. And I think that's why, as a Gundam fan, it is such a compelling production because it is all kind of clashing together almost at that level of like a dream, like pure unbridled id. It hasn't been organized yet. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's brilliant. Yeah. We love this movie. Let's talk about the music for a second, Sean. Uh, yep. Okay. Yep. We need to talk about the, like, I'm not sure if this, this story has ever been told. I've never, like, seen anybody talk about, like, involved in the production, how this happened. Um, but go ahead and tell us uh, some of the, one of the very interesting things about the soundtrack for Gundam F91. So, Gundam F91 was composed by Satoshi Kadokura. This is a new composer to the series. Um... Gundam had been composed by basically the same person across Zeta, Double Zeta, Shars, Counterattack. So this is kind of the first new person since the original Gundam. Um, and 
the first thing to say is that I do think this movie has a great score. It's mm-hmm. notably yeah. different. It's much more classical. It's almost it's actually almost baroque in places, particularly early on when it is kind of taking its cues from the aesthetics of the Rona family and this kind of high aristocracy. It has this kind of high baroque feel. It's very classical in places and it's much closer to maybe what we would say like western motif driven scoring in a big orchestral way. But it also clearly, like, throughout this movie, you see Tomino's love of Star Wars coming through in a couple different ways. Um, like, Corozo, I think, owes as much to Darth Vader as he does to Shara's novel, you know? Um, oh, absolutely, Maybe more yeah. so. And there are pieces of music that are just... There are ones that are reminiscent in, from Star Wars in ways that play to me as homage. Like, I think when you talk about, like, it, it, there are echoes of, like, the Imperial March here and there. But there is also at least one cue that is just straight up plagiarism. Like, there's no other way to say it. There is a, yeah. and it is, if you know The Empire Strikes Back, at the end of Empire Strikes Back, I'm going to lay in the music here. When they are trying to escape from Cloud City, there is a memorable piece of music that kind of goes like this. And then in Gundam F91, as the final battle is gearing up and you've got all the stuff with the bugs, you have a piece of music that goes like this. And they are almost identical <laughs> yeah it is it is uh you know it's like ice ice baby under pressure yes There's like one note that's like it's more of a duh than a duh or something you know but it is it is it's hilarious now like especially because that's the the star wars song is one of like the f- people's favorite pieces in star wars video games to use because it's a good video game song it's, it's i hear that song so much and so then when it comes up in f91 which is something i had completely forgotten about obviously i had noticed on my original viewing and it just had completely left my mind and so when some of that music starts playing I'm like jesus christ this is it's so blatant it's just it's it's as you said it's completely plagiarism i'm frankly amazed that like the, it's never been a thing like it's never yeah. especially I've never seen it be an issue it's never been replaced it's not it's this not ever come up i have no idea but it's just it's just never been a problem apparently i don't know why especially after the uh kenji yamamoto dragon ball scandal which if you uh-huh. know that story kenji yamamoto was a guy who worked on dragon ball video games and then he scored the tv show dragon ball kai and it had been an open secret his entire career that he plagiarized western music like that just everybody knew it there's there's fucking i think pink floyd in one of the dragon ball games and stuff like that like it's 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 way out there and finally when kai was on the air american companies started taking notice like specifically hollywood reached out to Toei and Toei there was a big scandal where Dragon Ball Kai they had to rip out all the music and put in old Dragon Ball music and it's it kind of like cut Dragon Ball Kai off at the legs more than it had even been cut off before um and you kind of think that maybe at that point Hollywood would have started going through other popular anime like I don't know the most popular anime Mobile Suit Gundam you know like something like that and looked for it and I guess they never did because F91 is like F91 is on 4K Blu-ray in Japan, Sean. Like it's been re-released many times and this has never been a problem. Um when it is one of the more obvious examples of music plagiarism I've I've seen and I don't fucking mind. I think it's great. I think it's an argument for plagiarism should just be a more accepted thing cuz it sounds fucking awesome. But at the same time, yeah, like you kind of wince at it just a little bit because it's this still this like big cultural taboo obviously. Yeah, it's it's weird. It it brings to mind um that the composer for Neon Genesis Evangelion like pretty also blatantly uh, plagiarized music from um James Bond. Um so the decisive battle song from Evangelion that's also in Shin Godzilla is just completely a plagiarized song from one of the 007 movies um which is just like just known and it's just I don't know it's weird. It feels like sometimes it gets caught, sometimes it's obvious and it just it gets let go and i'm not sure i mean I, maybe it's just that john williams and or that like his legal representation doesn't give a shit i it's never come up yeah. i have no idea but i find so, it very very funny do you uh here's a pop quiz sean when the hammer came down on kenji yamamoto do you remember the movie that specifically brought it to an end that he stole no from? i don't it's terminator salvation 
Like, it's the most <laughs> pathetic. It was the Danny Elfman score for Terminator 4 that ultimately, like, brought an end to Kenji Yamamoto's reign of plagiarism. And that is the saddest <laughs> sentence in the English language, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. I mean, th that's how it would go, though, right? You'd need yes. something like that that, like, is... Feels like it's coming from something petty enough or small yes. enough that's, like, like needs the respect or something that's gonna fight to get like, it. Like, what does um, John Williams care? Like... He's doing fine. Star Wars music wasn't negatively impacted by Gundam referencing it briefly in a movie from 1991. Like, who gives a shit, you know? But, yeah. like, yeah, Terminator Salvation barely made any money. We're going to sue whoever we can. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's very funny. It's very funny. Um... All right. Uh, any other thoughts on Gundam F91? I do want to talk about something else before we go. Um, like one thing I think, I feel like we didn't talk about it because it's been long enough for you since you watched the movie that it didn't come up naturally, but we just have to address the elephant in the room. Seabook Arno is one of the all time great Gundam names. Yep. It's just fucking amazing. Seabook in particular, his first name, I is just near and dear to my heart. I love it to death. It's weird. It's a weird fucking name, but it is just fucking perfect. It's fucking perfect. I have paid homage to it in my playthrough of Dragon Quest XI S on the Nintendo Switch. I named my protagonist Seabook, and it has already become my favorite name for a JRPG hero ever. Like, it is the perfect Dragon Quest name, and I imagine it will be one of my go-to names for a lot of, like, name generators in RPGs from here on out. It is... Yep. Seabook Arno is... Yeah, it is right the fuck up there with Quattro Bagina... Ramba Rao, it's it's one of the greats. Yeah, when I played through XCOM 2, I would name all my soldiers after different Gundam characters. Because it's useful because you get to go through a lot of people in XCOM, and there are lots of characters in Gundam, and Seabook Arno was one of the first, and he I think he was a sniper that was with me for almost the entirety of XCOM 2. It's, it's just it's a good fucking name. It's, it's just so a good. great you know, Tomino's you know, I admire him for a lot of things creatively. But the number one is his ability to come up with the just most incredible, ridiculous names. Absolutely. Um, because Garno is near the top. I think you and I have said this before, but like you and I both write creative fiction sometimes. Mm -hmm. The hardest thing for me, at least, is coming up with fucking character names. I, and I want to know what superpower it is that gave him the ability to just toss off all-time great character names like it's nothing. Like he's eating candy. It's insane. It's perfect. It's perfect. Arno, the hat's off to you, my friend. It's just... I, fucking great. I also want to give our friend Yoshikazu Yasuhiko a shout out for the hair colors in F91. I love mm -hmm. his embrace of like Seabook just full on has blue hair. Gundam really hadn't done this yet. Like Bright has green hair, but it's supposed to be black, obviously, you know? But like just full on, let's do some crazy hair colors. Cecily has orange hair. It looks so good in this movie. Like the paint they use on the hair colors just looks so vivid. I. I, like, and I don't think you could pull it off in digital animation. It's it's something that yeah. had to be done with hand drawn ink and paint, and it just it's it's one of the last gasps for that um, because in the '90s is when you're going to start getting the first digital ink and paint, and uh, oh, it's so good, it's so good. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. Yeah, it's particularly Cecily's hair is just like gorgeous. Like, yeah. they, it's I mean, the whole movie is just incredibly beautifully animated and, and has such an art, art like artistic eye and lens to the way it frames and uses characters. Yeah, and I mean, I, we can't overstate how well animated it is. This movie, to me, is, is in that S-level god rank tier with, like, Ghibli movies and Akira. <laughs> it's, like, the best movie animation I've ever seen, you know? Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. like, it's... Absolutely. Or, like, Sleeping Beauty, if you want to do an American example. Like, like the absolute upper echelon and it might be the only anime movie like based on a tv show i'd say that for because usually they don't usually like char's Counterattack or dragon ball super broly is the upper end of that you know where it's not going to be ghibli level but like it's still a fucking amazing astounding this one like breaks that ceiling i feel like yeah i agree it's it, it is as someone who has seen all of gundam it is the best looking gundam i think yeah. i don't think gundam ever gets to this level again um like maybe who knows in the future like unicorn gundam has some stuff with like the digital animation that is really fucking incredible but gundam the, the origin aesthetic... too i think yeah 
yeah, the, the aesthetic of Gundam F91 is more to my taste and then combined with just the, the lavishness of the production, it's it would be hard, I think, for Gundam as a franchise to top the, um, what F91 does. It really does feel like a what-if scenario of if the original Mobile Suit Gundam with these this creative team had been done as a movie and not a show. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, it, it does it because it, it, it kind of feels like what if it, like... You took those moments that are reanimated for the original Mobile Suit Gundam movies, that those like five second shots that are unbelievably gorgeously detailed, because here's this like one insert shot we need of this like ship docking or whatever. If you could make a whole movie out of that, um, is basically what F91 feels like. Yeah. Okay, so finally today, I want to talk at least a little bit about Crossbone Gundam. Have you, I know you own it, Sean. Have you read it yet? Uh, I have not gotten around to reading it. Oh, that's something I'm going to do now. I'm probably going to read it while I watch through Victory Gundam. Um, because because I only like rewatched F91 last night. So I didn't want to start reading it till I watched F91 again. Yeah, that's fair. So I will not give any spoilers, I promise. I just want to tell people what it's about. Because I feel like this is where we should mention it. Um, yeah. Because Crossbone Gundam is a manga that ran in Shonen Ace from 1994 to 1997. Um, and that is now available. It's only available in Japanese, but there are fan translations. Uh, as a six volume, that, that original run from 94 to 97 is six volumes. It was written by Tomino. So Tomino, I don't know if he like wrote chapter by chapter, but he at least gave the big plot outline. And it is very clearly a Tomino story when you read it. Uh, and then it was drawn by Yuichi Hasegawa. So there's that original Crossbone Gundam that is six volumes. The, sh the, the manga came back several years later in 2002 when the Gundam Ace magazine was up and running. Gundam Ace is the magazine that actually they launched just to do the Gundam The Origin manga, but it's been running ever since, and a lot of Gundam manga has been in there, like the Shars Deleted Affair manga was from Gundam Ace. And so they came back in 2002 for a follow-up like miniseries called Skull Heart, which is basically just a series of sort of extra stories around the original Crossbone Gundam. And then they did a, a series called Steel 7. And since then, uh, Crossbone Gundam has been running consistently since like 2003. It was Steel 7. When that ended, they did one called Ghost. And then they did one called Dust that is still running. Ghost is really long. Ghost was like 16 volumes. And all of that stuff from the 2000s onward is written and drawn by Yuichi Hasegawa. So Tomino has not had involvement in it outside of the original six volume run. I have read the original six volume run and then I have read Skull Heart and I've read almost all of Steel 7. Steel 7 is pretty short. I will admit I lost interest in it a little bit because I think the non-Tomino written stuff, if it's just Hasegawa writing it, I think it takes a dive in quality. But I would very much recommend fans read the original six volume run. There is a fan translation in English by Zionic Scanlations that you can find online. And it's very, very good. It's one of the best fan translations I've ever seen. Um, and you can, you can find it pretty easily. So go out and find it. Uh, or if you read Japanese like Sean, just import it. And you can read it that yep. way. Um, but it is very good. Crossbone Gundam is set in, set I think 10 years later, it's set in UC-133. And it follows a... Ooh, I've got to look up the main character's name because I'm suddenly forgetting it. Um, but it's... Uh, so yeah, it's set... I'm just going to cut this part out while I look this up. Let me make a note of when I have to do a cut. We are at 2, 10, 30-ish. Boop, boop, boop. Okay, so the main character of Crossbone Gundam is named Tobia Aronax. Very good name. <laughs> To yep. Tobia Aronax, and he is an exchange student from Earth being sent to live in the Jupiter colony. And as he is getting to Jupiter, the uh, Crossbone Vanguard attacks, and he meets a guy named Kincaid Now, which is uh, uh, who Seabook Arno has become. And it's not a secret thing. You know it's Seabook right away. Um, yeah. It's kind of like a Quattro Bagina situation. And Kid K Kincaid convinces him that they're not actually the bad guys, takes him back to the Crossbone Vanguard's mothership, where you meet Barrow Rona, who is now the captain of the Crossbone Vanguard. And the whole thing that they lay out here is that um, in the 10 years between F91 and Crossbone Gundam, um, the fight against the Cosmo Babylonia continued, and ultimately, 
Um, the Federation and Allied forces won, and Cecily takes over the Crossbone Vanguard. And like now it is under her stewardship and it is not this evil aristocratic organization. It's much smaller and it has become sort of a freedom fighting organization. And they learn of a threat from the Jupiter Empire, which we have known throughout Gundam. There's a bunch of weirdos off in Jupiter. And now yep. there is a big villain, uh, the big bad of the series who is basically planning an invasion of Earth, and the Crossbone Vanguard is going to fight him. The Crossbone Vanguard are not affiliated with the Federation or anyone else. In fact, they are known as space pirates, um, but they are, they're good pirates. And Crossbone Gundam is a really interesting series. Aesthetically, the mobile suits are infamously wonderful because it is all pirate-themed. So, like, mm -hmm. the Crossbone Gundam is basically the F-91 dressed up with an eye patch when it is doing uh, targeting. It has its gun looks like an old fashioned like flintlock pistol. Um, the the beam saber has like a hilt like an old fashioned saber. Um, it's all really cool. It's got a big cape that is basically a mobile shield. It's amazing. And the mother vanguard, the 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 main ship of the Crossbone Vanguard fleet, basically looks like Disney's Treasure Planet, where Disney's Treasure Planet is all these like big style old schooners like out in space. It's kind of like that. It's got this big like mast. It's really cool. And they go to fight the Jupiter Empire. And it is very much like Zeta Gundam in that the main character Tobia is kind of like um. Who's the main character? Camille. Yeah, he's kind of like Camille. He's a happier character than Camille. He's not manically depressed. But he is... Uh, it's, it's all through his point of view. He is very much the main character. But the older generation is there. And you learn their stories along the way. They do some really cool stuff with Kincaid and Barra. And I think their ultimate endpoint in the series is really satisfying. And I love what they do with those characters. Um, the art style is a little odd in that characters are all drawn sort of chibi fi so like Seabook and Bera do not really look like themselves in this series you just kind of have to take it on faith but I love all the other artwork and like it does action very well um, and the story they tell with all the Jupiter people is appropriately wacky for I think what we have had intimated about Jupiter over the course of the series and I really really like it um, so I heavily recommend that series Skull Heart is very hit and miss but it's got some fun little things and then Steel 7 is a good setup. It's basically a Seven Samurai riff, but I think it, I don't know, it like without Tomino, it starts feeling pretty fanficy to me. Um, and I mm -hmm. don't love Steel Seven, but I also like Hasegawa left to his own devices does some things I don't love. Like Crossbone Gundam has some, it does a lot of like gratuitous nude scenes with the women in the show, not in sexual situations, but it'll just like have Bera and another girl on the ship bathing together. So like, you do exposition, but you also get to look at boobs. And it's kind of, I roll my eyes at that stuff, and I don't love it. Um, but the general tenor of the storytelling is very good. And I think it is a crime worthy of a hearing at The Hague that Sunrise has not done a Crossbone Gundam anime yet. Because that original mm -hmm. six-volume run, it is... It would be a 26 anime episode anime series. It, it's so perfectly laid out to be that. It, you could do it so easily. It's it's just ripe for an anime adaptation. And it would slot in really well between F-91 and Victory Gundam. It's this giant missing piece of, I think, the Tomino puzzle. And it, the manga is good enough. But it is, it's so cool. It makes me want an anime. And I hope they do it someday. Um, it's been 20 years. They probably never will. But it's it's cool and it's worth reading. Awesome, yeah. Like, I'm really excited to get to it because it is Crossman Gundam is easily the biggest gap in my Gundam ness in having mostly only done the the like main TV shows and movies. Um, yeah, and it's one of those things where I remember playing. I think it was probably Gundam Breaker Three, but it's in like a bunch of the Gundam games I've played that kind of just here's like a bunch of Gundams and mobile suits from different eras of the show and just a lot of them to fight and stuff. In all those games, there's a bunch of Crossbone Gundam stuff. And it's like, and I was just like, what the fuck is Cross? Like, where is this from? Like, is this an F91 thing? And then looking it up and realizing, oh my God, there's like a huge part of Gundam that has only ever been in the manga and they've never adapted any of it. Like, it's not even like, here's like a fun little six minute special made for like a fan fest or something that we animated. There's just nothing from Crossbone Gundam that's outside of the uh, manga. So yeah, I'm really excited to get to it um, and, and fill that gap for me uh, because it has always been very glaring, especially because there is 
like clear heavy references to crossbow and gundam not in terms of like narrative stuff but like here's like a fun pirate kind of things that they'll do in some later gundam shows that are non-tomino um that i would like to kind of complete that circle um yeah it's, it's the only major piece of gundam media i feel like that the franchise cares a lot about but has never been used in the anime or in a movie yeah and let me just finish my spiel for people who might be interested um in terms of english translations you can find all of the original all of skull heart which is just one volume and all of steel seven which is three volumes and past that point mostly untranslated but that's also a good point to stop because the tobia aeronax like arc of the series ends with steel 7 steel 7 is a direct sequel set three years later and it just continues with tobia as the hero but uh, crossbone gundam ghost which is the next long series i think jumps all the way to its contemporaneous with victory gundam and it's a whole new cast of characters so and then i think dust is a sequel to ghost and dust the which is currently running in gundam ace is the furthest point in the uc timeline they've done because it's the first thing set after victory gundam um weird so crossbone gundam goes way beyond but like don't be stressed out about that if you want to follow like the f91 people you just need to read the original skull heart and then steel seven and then at that point it's a different series effectively because it's different characters in a different world um in skull heart there's a two episode two chapter arc where you get uh judo ashtow comes back under a fake name and there's some it's fun to see him it's not like the best like run of chapters ever but it is fun to have him there as like an i like it feels very true that judo would be an old dude still out there scrapping around in mobile suits oh yes yeah yeah judo is never going to stop he's mm -hmm. he's 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 my boy yeah oh, so judo. that's crossbone gundam and i'm sure we will talk about it more later sean i think we will have to at some point have just a gundam literature episode where we talk about different gundam lit we've read and i do think we're going to need to do a whole episode about the original novelization because it's just that sure, yeah. dense um and i know you've read it in japanese as well but next time we will do victory gundam I am like 15 episodes in. You haven't started rewatching it yet, right? No. Okay. Yeah. So I'll, that, that's something I'll do tonight. I'll watch the first few episodes tonight. I'm very excited to get back to Victory Gundam. Um, I remember really enjoying it and it being a weird, like Victory Gundam is weird. It's um, very weird. And, yeah. And, and you haven't even gotten to <laughs> the, the, to the weirdest stuff. Um, it's yeah, it's, it's, so Victory Gundam is the last show in the like original contiguous run of Tomino on Gundam. After um, Victory, you go to G Gundam, um, and then like Gundam Wing and stuff. And so you go, and Tomino comes back for Turn A Gundam and Reco and G, but he's never like the main dude in charge of the franchise after Victory Gundam. Um, so and I feel like as we talked about, this is something to readdress for Victory Gundam, but probably we will take a break after Victory Gundam for this podcast and have a gap before we reassess and figure out what we'll do past that point i think we'll do that like literature episode just for fun where we maybe talk about a book or two um and then yeah i'm gonna definitely be taking a break from gundam anime but i think we might still do some that comes out like in this feed because i know we want to do a evangelion episode i know oh, yes. there's some other mech anime that i might visit for my own edification that we could put in here because they involve gundam people like armored trooper Vodums. um so i think the party will continue but yes i think we've 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 done way more than we ever set out to do and covering <laughs> all of uc gundam will be a uh, a good point to maybe take a break right yes but for now like with gundam f91 jonathan this is only the beginning and next time we have to get ready to stand up to the victory. <laughs>